It is 5.30 p.m. on July 19, 2017, and this public meeting of the District of Columbia State Board of Education is now called to order. The role will now be called to determine the presence of a quorum. In the absence of our executive director, I will ask our vice president, Jack Jacobson of War Two, to please call the roll. President Williams. Present. Uh, vice President Jacobson is present. Ashley Carter. Uh, present. Laura Wilson Phelan. Ruth Wattenberg. Present. Lynette Woodruff. Present. Mark Jones. Joe Whedon. Present. Marcus Bachelor. Present. Madam President, you have a quorum. A quorum has been determined, and the State Board will now proceed with the business portion of the meeting. Members, I note that Member Lamar Wilson Phelan has it. Thank you. Members, we have a draft agenda before us. Are there any corrections or additions? Seeing no changes, I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Mr. Bachelor, second. Second. Ms. A Ms. Carter, all opposed? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Members, we have the minutes of the, from our July 12th working sessions before us. Are there corrections or additions to the July 12th meeting? Seeing no changes, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Mr. Weed. Second. Second. Ms. Carter. The motion being properly moved and seconded, I will ask for yeas and nays. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion is approved. Good evening. My name is Karen Williams, Ward 7, Representative and President of the State Board of Education. On behalf of the members of the District of Columbia State Board of Education, I want to welcome our guests and our view in public to our Wednesday, July 19th public meeting. The State Board typically holds its regularly scheduled meetings on the third Wednesdays of every month at the old council chambers at 441 4th Street Northwest. As a note to the public, the State Board will not hold a public meeting in August, but will return to the old council chambers on September 20th. Tonight's agenda will focus on the State Board's ongoing work to reduce chronic absenteeism in D.C. public and public charter schools. As President of the State Board, I am a member of the Truancy Task Force, now being named the Everyday, what is it, Everyday Counts Task Force, um, that is co-chaired by the Deputy Mayor of Education, Jennifer Niles, and Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services, Hasuk Kang. In addition to co-chairs, the following entities are represented. Child and Family Services, Criminal, Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, Court so Social Services Division, DC Public Charter School Board, DC Public Schools, the Department of Behavioral Health, the Department of Human Services, the Deputy Mayor of Greater Economic Ep Opportunity, the Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice, the Department of Health, the Department of Transportation, Justice Branch Administrations, the Metropolitan Police Department, Office of the State Superintendent, Office of the Attorney General, Offices of Chairman Phil Mendelson, and Council Member David Grossels, Public Charter School leaders and others. We are grateful that the Deputy Mayor for Education has enlisted the partnership of the State Board in these efforts to look forward to hearing an update on their progress and plans for the upcoming year. Our State Superintendent, Hans Kong, will not be with us tonight, so we will skip that portion of the meeting. The State Board welcomes public participation and activities under our authority. At every public meeting, we begin with testimony from public witnesses on education-related matters. We are thankful that many members of the public have co come to present comments to the State Board today. Although there is not an opportunity for discussion tonight on issues you raise, your comments will become part of our official record. As such, we will provide them to other agencies and government bodies in order to expand the reach of your words. If you are a member of the public 
and would like to speak at a future public meeting, please contact our staff by email at sboe at dc.gov or by calling 202-741-0888. Tonight we have multiple panelists. Please, get, please come down to the table when I call your name. Okay, where are the names? Ex excuse me, I have to find a list of names. But in the meantime, I'd like to thank Council Member Robert White for attending our meeting tonight. Marilyn Holmes from Total Sunshine, is she here? Scott Goldstein, teacher and leap lead from Roosevelt High School founder of Empower Ed, Keisha Thorpe, Tanya Martin, Monica Brokenborough, did I pronounce that correctly? Thank you. Teacher from Ward 8, Brian Butcher, Laura Fuchs, I don't see one. Okay, we'll, we'll go back around, okay? And Morgan Williams. <coughs> Mary Levy, I know you're here. Member of the public from War II residents. Okay, you have three minutes to speak this evening. Please note that you may must use the microphone in order to be heard. Your microphones are already on and ready. You will also see in your upper right hand side of the table a timer. The light will be green for the first two and a half minutes and the light will and then will turn yellow for the last 30 minutes. <coughs> we will begin on your left, my right, with Mary oh. Levy. Begin when you're ready, Miss Levy. I need a uh, <laughs> uh, Good evening, I'm Mary Levy. I've studied the school system for the last 37 years and kept archives and uh, done a lot of statistical analysis. One of the projects I've undertaken for a long time is tracking teacher turnover. Uh, I have a database that goes all the way back to 2001 uh, and I've also downloaded every study of teacher turnover that I can find on the internet to get comparative data. I've looked at the annual turnover rates in DC plus cohort rates, and I've looked at uh, the school leaving rates in the 4040 schools. Uh, the numbers are that uh, all ET15 teachers uh, leaving DCPS is almost 20% a year. Uh, the national average is 11% a year, and uh, the latest study that had 16 large urban districts, 13%, so we're high. If you look at cohorts, uh, there's over five years on the average, uh, we lose 56% of teachers. That compares with 45% uh, in other large urban districts. New hire teachers, they leave at a higher rate than the general teacher workforce. It's almost 25% a year. Uh, they're, they're gone in a year, 25% of them. Uh, over five years, three quarters of them leave. Nationally, the five-year average loss is 55%. So we are just high on any of those measures. I looked at the 4040 schools, the schools with the highest. Uh, they have high rates of poverty. They also uh, are those that are the lowest performing. Uh, every year on the average, one third of their faculty leaves. Nationally, with the only two studies I could find, <laughs> the low poverty schools leave it 15 to 20% a year. So 
we are high on, on any measure that I could find. Uh, we know from the literature that this can be very damaging educationally to children. It's also very expensive. I, I will end by noting that the charter schools have an even worse rate. Uh, but uh, that doesn't help us with DCPS. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Levy. Introduce yourself. Good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Goldstein. I'm a 10th year teacher, uh, currently teaching in DCPS, and the founder of a new organization called Empower Ed, which seeks to lift the voices of teachers to improve our schools. Teacher turnover is fundamentally about the climate created in our schools. DC continues to have some of the highest teacher turnover in the nation, especially in our most challenging schools, with 33% of teachers in DC's 40 lowest performing schools leaving each year. We cannot accept arguments that turnover is somehow a positive signal of the shedding of ineffective teachers when so many inspired teachers leave because of the culture of compliance that stifles their innovation and voice. DCPS lost some phenomenal educators this year. Katie Smith, a math teacher at my school for the past four years, as dedicated to her craft as anyone I've ever known, said of her experience, the distrust of teachers permeated through the staff this year. Enthusiastic teachers who I've known for up to four years were suddenly lacking in motivation to go above and beyond. In the end, after four years, I left DCPS to be closer to my family. That was the pull. But the push was the lack of trust and humanity given to me as an individual and to the staff as a whole. This is systemic, not just one teacher in one school. Losing inspired teachers is preventable. The Insight School Culture Survey given to all DCPS teachers each year provides data that could predict teacher turnover and be used dynamically to prevent that turnover. From 2015 to 2016, on the question of is this a good place to teach and learn, my school went from 62% to 28%, a 34% drop in just less than one year. On 29 out of 30 questions on the survey, our school went down by an average of 19% on 29 out of 30 questions. Had those alarming numbers been public, DCPS could have been compelled to do something about that before we experienced the departure of some amazing educators at the end of the year. At the least, the State Board of Education and the public should have those insight numbers. In 2012, Kaya Henderson identified the 4040 lowest performing schools in the district, committed to increasing proficiency by 40% by this year. That meant heavy investment and heavy surveillance from central office based on the belief that struggling schools will improve um, faster through the increased compliance rather than local innovation. Five years later, 4040 schools are nowhere near those targets. The failure is directly tied to our failure to create a culture of innovation, inspired teaching, and the retention of our best teachers. Principals are also victims of this culture of fear. In turnaround schools, with their job constantly on the line, they're naturally afraid to take risks that challenge the mandates of instructional superintendents, who are afraid to loosen the reins and allow innovation because they have to prove themselves to the chancellor and the chancellor to the mayor. That's the dangerous culture of fear mayoral control has produced. A culture where anything, including great inflation, underreporting suspensions, and more happens not because of bad people, but pressure to improve stats for a shiny brochure or next year's campaign. When I served on the Chancellor's Teacher Cabinet two years ago, both Henderson and Jason Camrys told me that impact had finally gotten them the teachers they wanted in the system, and they would move to models like LEAP to make those great teachers content experts. If they believe that, they need to start respecting and trusting teachers they have, handpicked as true professionals, with the same autonomy that a professional doctor or lawyer would have in their craft. But when resources turn into a never-ending stream of mandates from central office, great teachers run for the door. The new LEAP initiative could be transformative, and the new chancellor has spoken of collective leadership, which is promising. But new uh, autonomy does not hamper accountability. It's proven to increase it. With transparency and accountability for school climate and staff morale, we can prevent inspired teachers from leaving DC's neediest schools and improve our results for all students. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening and thank you. I am Monica Brokenborough, teacher at Baloo High School as well as the building representative. A recent study in New York indicated that students in grade levels with higher turnover um, score lower in both English language arts and math and that these effects are particularly strong in schools with more low performing and black students. Moreover, the results suggest that there is a disruptive effect of turnover beyond changing the distribution in teacher quality. Another study presented at a conference held by the Center for Longitudinal 
data in educational research indicates that when teachers leave schools, overall morale appears to suffer enough that student achievement declines, both for those students taught by the departed teachers and by the students whose teachers remained. IMPACT is DCPS's system for assessing and rewarding the performance of teachers and other school-based staff. This year, there were several major changes made to the IMPACT evaluation system. All observations are conducted via in-house administration. Last year, DCPS had master educators that were not school-based, and they were content specialists and were an impartial third party that traveled from school to school. Throughout the 2015-16 school year, the master educator would conduct two observations on a teacher, and the in-house administration would conduct the remaining observations. Informal impact observations have been eliminated. The number of observations has decreased. During the 2015-16 school year, most teachers received four formal observations and one informal observation, and now they only receive three formals. During the 2015-16 school year, any observation that was one full point value lower than the average of the other scores, the low score would be dropped. This has been eliminated for the 2016-17 school year. There has also been an, a new addition during this year with a student satisfaction survey which accounts for 10% of a teacher's final score. To my knowledge, these drastic alterations to the subjective impact value system evaluation system were not negotiated with the Washington Teachers Union prior to implementation. As a result, administrators, which are not even content specialists, are given complete autonomy over the employment status of teachers. Specifically at Ballou High School, a team of administrators use impact as a professional bullying tool to eliminate teachers based on their personal feelings towards the individual and not based on job performance. I've been employed by DCPS for two years as a music teacher at Ballou High School. During the 2016-17 school year, I became the proud building representative and unfortunately witnessed the deplorable working conditions that played a significant impact in the high turnover rate of teachers in DCPS. Students reporting to class for several months with the absence of a certified teacher. Students constantly missing class due to a ridiculously high number of field trips. Most field trips were not even educational. Lack of support, training, communication with staff, especially new hires. Uncontrollable student behavior. Teachers physically assaulted and verbally abused by students. Teachers verbally abused by administration. Preferential treatment by providing advance notice of formal observations to certain teachers, although impact observations are supposed to be unannounced. Failure to review documents submit submitted by teachers to score impact components such as CSC and TAS. Copying, pasting generic score reports to send to multiple teachers for scoring. Submitting false comments to deduct points from core professionalism. Teachers assigned to teach courses in which they do not hold the legal required certifications. Holding teachers accountable for in-seat attendance via deducting CSC points. Failure to comply with the guidelines in the impact guidebook. Failure to comply with the collective bargaining agreement. Retaliatory acts against active WTU members and misappropriation of funding for instructional resources. These egregious acts have been reported in the form of grievances and in-person meetings with labor management and employee relations personnel with no prevail or justice for teachers. Unfortunately, there is absolutely no oversight or supervision of the actions of in-house administrators and they take full advantage of this opportunity. Prior to the placement of the present administrative team, Ballou High School had a significantly higher number of effective and highly effective teachers with an article that was published in the Washington Post. However, at the conclusion of this school year, I have been contacted by six Ballou High School teachers that have lost their jobs due to unfair bias impact scores. Each of these teachers are unsure of their employment future and are fearful of not being able to provide for themselves and their families. It pains me to witness my colleagues endure the permanent damage inflicted by professional bullying. It is highly noteworthy that many of the mid-year resignations at Ballou High School were due to unjust impact scoring. Several of these teachers were not willing to stick around and allow a set of rogue administrators to determine their fate and bar them from future teaching employment opportunities. Therefore, these teachers opted to resign. Also, do not be fooled into thinking that the teacher turnover at Ballou was not an issue. Shortly after the story was published about mid-year resignations, there was an effort to override the significance with stories pertaining to college acceptance. However, the majority of the senior class graduated due to an unethical implementation of credit recovery as a means of increase, increasing the graduation rate. 
Blue High School was recently slated for the largest budget cut of $637,400. Unfortunately, teacher turnover is also likely to have a significant fiscal impact as schools and districts must fund additional recruitment programs, implement interview and hiring procedures, and provide additional professional development, not to mention the loss of exp experience and expertise. In a study on the cost of teacher turnover, researchers estimated these costs could be as much as 150 percent of the leaving teacher salary, though they recommend an average estimate of 20 percent. Therefore, it is devastating to see tax dollars utilized in this manner. Today I have a big ask. Assist with reinstating employment to teachers at Blue High School that have been bullied and evaluated in an unfair, unjust manner. Provide oversight of the actions of in-house administrators and DCPS officials. Thank you. Thank you. My, oh, my name is Brian Butcher. I'm also a teacher from Blue Senior High School, Social Studies. Um, I want to speak personally about my experience at Blue. Um, so you yeah, get a better insight to what really goes on in Baloo and why so many teachers left Baloo or are leaving Baloo. Uh, I came to Baloo two years ago um, in the second reconstitution. That meant the school hired 80% of the staff were brand new. Uh, this is my second year there and out of the 80% who were hired, almost all of us, or I would say about 85% of us have left the school. And I think the main reason why most of us are leaving the school, school system is because of the bullying and the use of impact as retaliation against teachers. Especially if you're a teacher that's a member of like the SCAC team or any um, WTU um, organization on the campus, excuse me, you're, you are bullied, you are uh, impacted low, and then you're really ineffective. Um, the members of the SCAC team, um, Dr. Stubblefield resigned because she got a low impact score. The math teacher, Ms. George, resigned because she had a low, mat, uh, low impact score. Um, Ms. Williams and myself, we got low scores too. And now we have to grieve, um, we have to grieve, the pro go to the grievance process to, to, uh, to restore our jobs. Uh, so it, it's a continual process goes on in blue like this. And the question I'm, I want to ask is, we've been to the city council. We gave this stuff to Mr. Grasso. We went down and spoke to LMER about what's going on in blue. And nothing is being done. Nothing is being done. So my question is, what will be done? This has to stop. No one should have the power to eliminate somebody because they don't like them. That's unconstitutional. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you for your testimony. Madam Chair. If you would leave a, if you have a copy. Yes, you, I, I emailed my copy. Would you please leave it so that we can get it to the uh, formal authorities? The proper authorities, I apologize. Madam yes, Chair. Yes, Mr. Bachelor. I think um, given the light of the, the number of public witnesses we have today, and, and it seems um, a very important issue and something I think that, that we could glean some very helpful information from, uh, I'd like to move to suspend our rules to allow one round of three-minute questions per panel per member uh, so that we may be able to glean some information from these witnesses who took the time to come uh, and address us today. Second, I think that's so important given what we have just heard, which is pretty extraordinary. And I'll say at my own high school, there's huge uh, levels of turnover this year uh, as well, very destructive. And I think it's important to know what's going on. So I would support that. Ms. Jacobson. Mr. Jacobson is acting as our parliamentarian today. Uh, the motion has been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? If not, I, I do. Yep. Ms. Van. I, I just want to say I appreciate the effort to engage public witnesses and to hear more about what they have to say and have our questions answered. But um, Ruth, I would just make sure that we're saying we're listening to the perspectives of those shared here. To find out what's going on, we would have to have a lot more information in front of us uh, from 
all sides of the picture. And so I want to make sure we're classifying what we're hearing as the perspective of those being shared. I, I mean, I certainly agree with that, that what we hear is what we hear, and then maybe there are others who would like to come and testify as well, but these are certainly important voices. Um, my, my only thought was we've had these discussions for quite some time. Um, I just encourage members who would like to change our bylaws to bring those suggested changes to the administration committee for discussion and implementation. With that, I ask call the roll. Uh, President Williams. No. Vice President Jacobson is a no. Ms. Carter. Ms. Wilson Phelan. Yes. Ms. Wattenberg. Yes. Dr. Woodruff. Yes. Mr. Jones. Yes. Mr. Whedon. Yes. Uh, Mr. Bachelor. Yes. Uh, Madam President, the ayes are six, the nays are three. Um, the motion to suspend the rules has passed. Okay. One second while I figure out how to do this. All right, for so the four panelists who just uh, spoke, please return to the di uh, dais podium. All right, we will have one round of questioning, starting with Mr. Batchelor. Well, one, uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, one, I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us uh, this, this evening, um, especially uh, to my constituents from Blue High School, um, who uh, we know have had a particularly difficult situation this past school year. And so your perspective is definitely appreciated, um, and, we, and we thank you for the time. Uh, I, my first question, I think, um, it, are to the teachers on the panel. Um, We've heard a lot about um, the negative impacts on school climate uh, and teacher climate um, in regards to the impact system, um, and um, among other things. Um, but I think more broadly, could, could I just ask some of the teachers on the panel, what, what are the things that could be done both at a system level um, and, and I think at an individual school level, but, but more particularly at a system level, uh, that would improve uh, s school culture and would improve the support uh, that teachers need to be successful uh, in our classrooms. So I'll start. Um, I think there is more of a demonstrable link in evidence between uh, staff morale and student achievement than there is between any of the factors that have received substantial attention and funding over the past several decades, right? So whether that's vouchers, charter movements, data and accountability, uh, drives for testing, there is a very direct link in multiple studies between the correlation between staff morale, teacher turnover, uh, not just of ineffective teachers as they're rated by the impact system, but of very innovative teachers like I mentioned before, and uh, teacher turnover and ultimately student achievement. But there's a direct link right, between staff morale and student achievement through uh, evidence over a number of decades. Um, there's a lot that can be done about that. The single ask I asked in my testimony is that there is a survey out there that has a good measure of, of uh, staff morale from those who take it. There could be better surveys that are done as well, but the insight survey is the one that we have right now. That data could have predicted. Um, we got those numbers in January, right? So we could have been aware at that point that there was going to be high turnover. If those numbers were made available to the state board to D, uh, by DC Public School to the city council to others, um, we would be able to to um, intervene uh, earlier. And so I think bringing transparency and accountability uh, to staff morale issues. But second, and this is the work that I'm doing with Empower Ed that I introduced, is that teachers need to be more part of an integral of daily decision making in schools. Uh, LEAP has done that to some extent with curriculum, but it's not fitting into the broader pattern of uh, the top-down uh, culture that DCPS has instituted. They're already starting to talk about how to in incorporate LEAP into impact, right, by making uh, uh, leap coaches uh, a part of your impact evaluation, right? And so resisting the temptation to make things that are supposed to be about collaboration and trust, to have to resist the temptation to also make them about evaluation. At some point, if we do have the teachers 
that we're requesting, and they've made that declaration to me and others. If we do now have those teachers because we've been using impact, it's time to trust the people we have. Can I respond? I know my time has elapsed, but I'll ask the chair if she'll allow it. Do you have a question, Ms. Carter? I, Ms. Wadenberg? I, I know I do have a question, okay. yeah. Yes, go ahead. Um, Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, this is a very important issue. It's something that I've personally been looking into. Uh, even, and I'm very sympathetic to the t high teacher turnover. Um, it's, it's something that has angered many, many constituents across the, sti across the city. Um, my, my question is actually specifically for Mr. Goldstein, Goldstein and his testimony. Um, and actually, if anyone else has uh, some questions, this might actually be something uh, that um, the, Miss, the teacher from Baloo, I, I apologize, your last name. Broken Book. Oh. Broken Book. Uh, may also be able to answer. Um, in your testimony, you talked about uh, obviously staff morale and climate and culture and how uh, principals themselves were didn't have the autonomy to really set a climate that they wanted to for the schools and that they were actually scared by some of the uh, many many different um, restrictions that they have uh, looking into some of the studies going on in Chicago, Chicago equally had high teacher turnover rates, and they saw that you know it, this all came down to the majority of it principals setting the culture and tone for the school. Um, do you believe that this comes down to that number one the factor uh, number one factor is principals uh, in the school and if they were given more more slack or more rope, having more autonomy, uh, would this be helpful to the teachers and the school system? I'll try to be brief so you can come in too. I think if you ask 10 people in 10 different schools, you might get 10 different answers on that question right. because of the variety of principles and their relationship with staff. I think that teacher empowerment is the number one factor um, and the autonomy of teachers who have proven to be innovative and inspired um, and effective in their classroom, not just as measured by impact, but other measures of innovate, innovation in the classroom can be given the autonomy to lead within their schools. That is the number one factor that could increase morale. But I do think that principals are in part a victim to that system because there are principals who want to have the backs of their teachers, who want, to, who want their schools to be able to innovate and follow a mission that might not align with the view of the instructional superintendent or might not be the thing that you know, puts uh, numbers on the brochure quickly enough. Um, and so I think they're part of that system as well. And like you said, um, right, if you talk to 10 different teachers, you will get 10 different answers. Because at Baloo, I do feel that um, our administration was, were given complete autonomy. And they kind of went the an unfortunate direction with that by taking advantage of it and using it to bully people. So um, as far as like, you know, making teachers collaborative, inclusive, you know, it was a lot of selective choosing of who our administration would collaborate with. So basically, if you weren't on like, you know, that list of preferential people, you were excluded from these decision-making processes. So like I said before, there just needs to be a lot more oversight when they do give all of this autonomy to them because unfortunately we do have some administration that will take advantage of that and it works to the disadvantage of the employees. Uh, I, I, think, I think also too, I think there's more collaboration needs to be done. Um, Baloo in particular, there, I don't think there's any collaboration at all. Uh, and a school like Baloo, there's a need for collaboration because we are a hard to staff school. Uh, we have a whole slew of problems. And I think one of the things that has been um, bandied about, about Baloo, Baloo is a school in crisis. It's all been a school in crisis. And no one's looking at Baloo as a school in crisis. You can, I worked in the second floor, and in the second floor I had, I was the only teacher there that was not a sub for many days. And that's a school in crisis. Thank you very much. Ms. Wadenberg. Yeah, I want to start with a couple of quick factual questions to Mary Levy, and then I want to come back to the rest of you. Mary, you were very good about um, saying what the DC number was and the national number. Mm -hmm. So for example, 20% a year of DC teachers or people on the teacher level um, 
turnover each year compared to 13 percent of big urbans nationally and 11, uh, big urbans nationally and 11 percent nationally, and so on. When you talked about new teachers, you said that we lost 25 percent of them in the first year. Do you know what the national number is on that? Is, is, is it Unfortunately, I, you know, I have read dozens of articles. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to, it was the one hole would in, not in this find it. I looked data. for it. Um, so I just want to make a, a note that um, kind of relates to what a number of you were talking about. Um, if 25 percent of our teachers are leaving each year, my understanding from the literature is that most teachers don't become even decent, you know, decent until their third year. So basically, every year we're subjecting our kids to 25 percent of teachers who haven't even reached a modest level of quality. Um, and as I understand it um, from Ms. Levy, that number is um, uh, th 33 percent in our highest poverty, most challenged schools like Baloo. So I just want to note this is tremendous. Um, it's a tremendous problem. Um, we're told often that the retention of highly effective teachers is very high. I think the 80 percent or something. Um, but that doesn't get to this fact that a quarter of the teachers leave each year, and those are the teachers um, that our kids are, are learning from. So I just wanted to note that. Um, one question I have, when I was talking to, I interviewed a number of the teachers that left from our high school, Wilson, and I heard a lot about um, what I would call kind of the blizzard of mandates, sort of the, uh, the top-down issues, and they've come up a little bit. Um, some of it had to do with the way LEAP was implemented. Some of it had to do with a new grading system that required teachers to give grades that weren't necessarily their intention. And I'm hearing really two different things. There's that, which I think is a very serious problem and greatly impedes the ability of teachers to create a climate that in turn creates good learning conditions. But I'm also hearing something that's either far down that continuum or really something different, which is the bullying. Um, and I wonder on the um, I, I guess one question for each on the bullying, do you think there are other schools where this is an issue? And then on the, so let me start with that. Um, absolutely. Um, like I stated earlier when I introduced myself, I am the building representative for Baloo, but um, I've actually had um, teachers at other schools reach out to me because um, their union leader, you know, wasn't really available or very responsive. So I've heard it from several schools where it is an issue and, you know, that's why a lot of people will leave mid-year because if you wait until that final score post over the summer, you're done. It's all, we call it like the felony for teachers. Once you get that, it's almost virtually impossible to find employment anywhere else. Even like I've heard recently, even PG County is starting to ask for teachers DC impact scores. So people resign before right, they're going to get the impact score. Right. So before that final score post and, you know, it's like I said, this year I listed all the changes that were made to impact and it's before we had the master educators, so it kind of balanced it out because we would have a couple of evaluations from someone who was not housed in the building and it was a lot more fair. And now that everything's done in-house, people are seeing their scores plummet if they aren't on that special list of teachers. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, my first question, thank you all for coming, but my first question uh, to Ms. Levy, uh, I missed part of your um, testimony, but I, I want to ask you about the process for determining the 20 percent. Uh, first of all, if you can speak to the process, and then I want you to speak to the reliability of the process, uh, because I believe there's a problem, but my belief is one thing, but I, I also believe that we should trust our numbers, and we should have data um, that that demonstrates we have a problem. So if you can speak to the process and the reliability of it, please. Uh, every oh. year I get an employee list from the school system. Often that comes through uh, responses to the DC Council in performance oversight. Um, but I also, if necessary, file a FOIA request. I then track teachers from year to year by name uh, often I'm able to have an employee ID number, which um, makes that easier. It's a tedious process, but I do track them by name, year by year. And uh, I have a, a huge database with 
a list of teachers each year. And if I get any other information, uh, I correct it. For example, sometimes a teacher will be there one year, not there the next year. But then the following year, that teacher will be back. So that teacher was only on a leave of absence. And uh, that's, that's how I do it. Uh, okay, also in your, in your numbers, does it, um, for students at a certain time, they are, they're marked habitually truant. If before a teacher leaves, sometimes there's uh, a, a, you can see a pattern. Yes. Do you track that pattern? Do you have a benchmark to say, okay, if this teacher has been missing for five days or ten days within? Now, that information is not available to the public. It and is not. in any event, what I do is it's point in time. It's midwinter one year to midwinter the next year. I do not pick up uh, any of the teachers uh, that were discussed in the Washington Post article, those who come in at the beginning of the year and resign before midwinter. So uh, it, ideally, the information is there in the school system's computers. Um, but to my knowledge, no one has has ever gotten access to it and tracked it. Okay. Are you tracking for public, uh, traditional public and charters? No, I don't track charters, uh, but they report, they do annual reports to the Public Charter School Board, and then they report their turnover. I have not analyzed that. Somebody else did and uh, put a post on the internet about it, uh, and it is higher in the charter schools, definitely. Than in Who's DCPS. responsible for that reporting from the charters? The, the principals at the schools are? Whoever is the, uh, you know, the principal or the CEO of each charter school would be responsible. Uh, they, they have a, f the public charter school board has a format that charter schools are supposed to follow. I don't know that 100% of them do because they're jealous of their autonomy, but most of them have reported that particular number. Okay, thank you. I do have more questions, but my time is up, but thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, well, I have very quick follow-up to what Mark was asking, Mary. So when a teacher transitions to another school, you're able to capture that? The figures I have given you are not uh, school leavers, uh, the 20%. That's just leaving DCPS. In order to track teachers moving from school to school within the system, um, that's an even more tedious process. Mm -hmm. uh, it took me some days to do it for the 40 lowest performing schools. Uh, I would like to do it, and when I get the time, I will do it. <laughs> but it really shouldn't be necessary. We should have some professional organization <laughs> You know, I could get run over by a metro bus and then you wouldn't have any numbers. Yeah. <laughs> don't say that, Mary. Um, don't do that. So just to be clear then, the, so the information you provided about the 20% is DCPS wide and doesn't control for transfer between schools? No, it does not. Okay, that's it, really It helpful. does for the 40, 40 schools, but uh, not generally. Okay, and then um, I had a question for Mr. Goldstein related to your comment about um, the level at which you want teacher input solicited and taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And you gave one example about how, if I understood you correctly, you do not think that LEAP should influence impact. But yeah. I wondered if you had other examples of the kinds of things that you don't feel that teachers are a part of in terms of decision making that you think they should. So on LEAP, I would say, look, I understand the process of saying that LEAP is now part of someone's job, so they should be evaluated as part of the whole pie of what's in their job. At the same time, the entire push towards LEAP is founded on the idea that now we're moving towards more trust of people who have been effective in the system, even the system has validated as effective under their own evaluation. So now we're gonna trust those people to lead their peers. And so I think if we're gonna to move towards collaboration and trust, we need to move towards collaboration and trust, right? That trust actually has to be evident in the process. Um, there's a whole lot of ways, uh, obviously, there's a union structure uh, within our public schools that the charter schools don't even have, so there's an even bigger issue there. Uh, 
but even with that, there's a level of decision making at the schools which you know principals and administrations can decide or not decide to include teachers on issues of um, uh, of hiring and firing, of budgeting, um, of school programming, on announcement of new initiatives and rollout of new initiatives, on strategic planning for the school and the school's uh, yearly plan. So there's a whole lot of issues where teacher decision making could be more integral to decision making. Yeah. What I think is you need to identify those innovative and inspired teachers in each school um, and make sure that there's an, a way, a systematic way for them to be part of those decision making. So the, I'm just going to cut you off because I'm out of time. So there is the LSAT in every right, traditional right, public yes. school has teachers on it who yes. are elected by their peers. And not only that, it's teachers, parents, community member, a member of the administrative staff, and they are responsible and legally mandated to sign off on strategy and budget. So I think there needs to be transparency and accountability to uh, whether school administrations uh, use them effectively. Okay. From school to school. Right, but just for, so, so I just want to encourage it's really important for me anyway as an uh, official in DC to hear really grounded data and facts right and I know that you all are teachers and presenting your own perspectives but there is a structure for that right so so in order for me to say like yes that's something we need to do there has to be an acknowledgement that the structure exists and then I then when you said like oh well we should be transparent and we should be working on them more effectively then I can understand where you're coming from I just wanted to Share that. And I could give concrete examples uh, for the that. LSAT. Let me make a quick comment on that. We have that structure in Baloo, but it was avoided. Right. Um, the SCAC and the LAT, and uh, the last, um, uh, I was member with the SCAC team, and she refused to meet with us. She refused to meet with us. We invited her several times, she refused to meet with us. So, you know, the things are in place, but it depends on the principal of the building. Thank you. Mr. Wheaton? So, I'll echo that comment. Um, the LSAT at Elliott Hine Middle School, where my daughter attends, has not approved budget expenditures this year. Um, the process has been skirted, and that re happens regularly. Um, so while on paper there is a process, we're not following yeah. the process. Um, and I think that goes for a number of things, spending, a allocations. Um, to borrow from something that Emma Brown from The Post tweeted out earlier this week, for a system that claims to be data-driven, we're not using data well. And that's where I'd really like to see something, and I'd like to request from my colleagues that the testimony that we get tonight and that a summary of our discussion is published um, and that we ensure that this is public record and that we are pushing for the data to be transparent. Um, and we'll talk about other ways that we can do that to encourage the council to make that. We don't have authority here. Um, a couple of things I just want to touch on real quick. Um, principal turnover has been touched, and I'd love to get your thoughts on the impact that that has on teacher turnover. In Ward 6, over the last two years, 10 of our 18 schools um, have seen, 10 or 12 of our 18 schools have seen new principals. Um, what impact does that have on teacher turnover? It's just open to especially the teachers on the panel. Um, I'm not sure if I'm the best one to answer this. Um, I've been at Baloo for two years and we've had the same principal there for um, the two years I've been there, but however we have seen changes within the administrative team, like one of our assistant principals who was there last year, he's no longer there, and then they've brought in two new assistant principals, and I can say um, one of those was over the mathematics department and the special education department, and when you look at the correlation, most of our resignations came from the mathematics and the special education department, so there's definitely a connection that needs to be looked a little bit more in depth into. So um, it does have at Blue, it did have an um, impact on teachers because once we got in those two new assistant principals, we saw an uptick of people resigning within those specific departments. So I can speak to that as well. So this is my th be my third year at Roosevelt. There's been four principals um, from the time that I first applied to the school um, under one principal to during the summer, the principal that interviewed and hired me. The school year once I started was a third principal that was then in charge uh, for that year uh, who was only given the ability by central office to be principal for one year. That was his, his mandate. Um, yep. uh, and then there was a fourth principal that came in uh, the following year as they relaunched the school in a new building. So there's no doubt uh, that that has an effect. Um, 
Uh, it can be dizzying, right, uh, for, for any staff person. And I think the main effect is the mandates and new initiatives that come down and how that impacts your day-to-day -day practice and instruction. To go back to Ms. Wattenberg's point from earlier, um, I think the main thing is central office is not always talking to each other on those mandates. So there's a lot of things that come down onto our daily plates as teachers. Um, and some parts of central office might express a great deal of flexibility and have great intentions with their initiatives. And other part, and the school administration might not know that central office has expressed that flexibility to us. There's just not the talking to each other. So I'm out of time, but real quick, I would argue that central office almost entirely has great intentions. How that's implemented at the school level can vary considerably and have negative impacts. So Yeah, and I would say that uh, there is research literature on that subject, rigorous research, which finds a definite correlation not only between principal turnover and teacher turnover, but principal turnover and student achievement. Thank you. Ms. Dr. Thank you for coming out and sharing. Um, some of the th things that concern me are, as we look at the turno teacher turnover, and Mary, I know you have gathered data on it, I'm interested in knowing it, the data on teacher turnover, but, it, but the teachers are leaving a particular school and moving to another school, that school movement, that, that waiting for Superman type a thing where they, they shift from one school to the next. And so, and so the new teachers coming in for that first three years, we know that that happens around the country, that we you lose a lot of students. But within D.C., do we have a waiting for Superman effect happening um, in our schools where, um, where principals that know that there are particular teachers that are teaching uh, and once them at their school are waiting to get them, um, is that also happening, which means that we're losing uh, good quality teachers at some schools because the relationship may be built with another principal or they're waiting to get to a school closer to where they live or you know things like that. I'm afraid I don't have the numbers on that. I did notice in the 40-40 uh, analysis mm -hmm. that teachers who left one of the 4040 schools sometimes showed up at another. And anecdotally, I can tell you that uh, I hear there's a sort of general westward movement mm -hmm. in the city. Yeah. And um, my second, uh, I have a few minutes. Uh, uh, um, impact really is something that bothers me to the heart because of the fact that even though I wasn't a teacher, I was an administrator that was, that was scored with an impact. And the principal at that time at the school I was at didn't particularly care for me. And so as a result, he marked me down 10 points and then he resigned. And that score stayed on my record without a validation because he left the, the area, moved to another state. So impact plays a big part in, in the lives uh, of our teachers, in the lives of our administrators, in the lives of, of our principals, because they're being looked at as well. But what bothers me more so than anything is the bullying that can happen when the accountability isn't there. And so if you're having a scoring system where everyone in that building that is an administrator or, or the, the scorers are administrators in that building, there's not a check and balance and um, I went through the check and balance where I went to the attorneys. But once that person left the system, it, that 10 stayed on my record. And so I, w I, I think that's something that the DCPS needs to look at closer. And they need to have teachers on, on, on the development of making that impact a better, useful process of evaluating teachers. So I appreciate you sharing this information with us today, and thank you. Mr. Jacobson. Thank you all for coming here, and thank you for your courage, particularly for the teachers and um, school staff. It's difficult to speak truth to power, especially when you want to continue in your positions, and, and I take that very seriously. My mother was the grievance committee chair for her school, school union, and uh, so I've got a little experience back here. With, with this type of thing, and I know how difficult it is for all of you involved. 
Um, I did want to raise a couple of points. I don't necessarily have any questions, but I'll give anyone who's got something left to say a minute um, at the very end. Uh, when we did our work on ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, we, um, we did a lot of work around school climate surveys and making sure the school climate survey goes beyond just the students that a school serves, but also to the teaching staff and to the support staff to make that school work and work well. Uh, we pushed and we got Aussie to agree on a pilot program that will then come back to this board for implementation citywide. So I wanna make sure that you know that we are working on some of these issues, not all of them, but some of them. We're working on it diligently and we're working with the superintendent on this because we heard this loud and clear throughout our ESSA discussions over the last year or so. I also wanted to take a minute to thank you in particular, Mary Levy, for the information that you provided to this board and our Closing the Achievement Gap Committee that was chaired by Tiara Jolly. Uh, as chair of that committee, her focus was on teacher and principal retention and turnover, and you gave us invaluable information on that, and we need to continue to follow up with that work that Ms. Jolly started uh, because we've been working on it for a year and a half. We need, we need more data. You've been able to provide it to us. Some of our other education partners have not been as willing to work with us, but uh, at the end of the day, we need to respect our teachers, we need to respect our staff, we need to, we need to create environments that are healthy for our students. So with that, I've got a minute left. If anyone's got anything to say that they haven't already, you're welcome to the time. I just wanna thank you uh, for your words of thanks um, and, and just contribute to close that this is not an issue that should be threatening to anyone, right? Um, we all wanna retain great teachers, right? And I think your words about the intentions of central office staff, about the intentions of principals, uh, this should be an issue that we all wanna solve together because we wanna retain great teachers to build better schools. And so this shouldn't be an issue where there's anyone up here that feels like it's difficult to talk to a principal or it's difficult to talk to someone at central office because that should be our goal. And we have to come to a consensus that retaining teachers uh, is the goal and not the shedding. Uh, our effective teachers. And I'd just like to say thank you too because um, there's been so many times where teachers want to speak and we're not given opportunities. So I would just like to thank all of you, especially Marcus Bachelor, for listening to us and allowing us to come down because I mean, we have a lot that needs to be heard because at the end of the day, it's not just our jobs. This is the impact that's having on children, especially our poor babies in Ward 8. I'd like to say thank you too. But I'd like to say one more thing. I think there needs to be a shift from um, to creating better teachers than getting rid of, there's no, there's no bad teachers. teachers. Good teachers are created, they're developed. And you don't, you don't develop in one year or two years, it takes more than two or three years. So, the, so this way of saying someone is ineffective because they scored low in one year and never got a chance to develop, it needs to be a shift to the other perspective, I think, to retain better teachers. Last but not least, I would just like to say thank you for coming down. I was a DCPS teacher who left under duress, <laughs> so I understand the situation, and also a graduate of Baloo High School, so I know the potential of the school and where it is when I went to school and where it is now. Um, so I, I really appreciate your bravery and honesty, and thank you, and please leave a copy so that we can get these um, testimonies out to the proper authorities. Thank you. Thanks I'd again. Like, I'd like to call the next panel. Um, is Keisha Thorpe here? Tanya Martin? Laura Oaks? And Morgan Williams? Morgan Williams, is she here? Then Miss Davis, would you come forward? Thank you. Make sure you're talking to the mic. We're going to go from my right, your left, starting with Ms. Davis. You have three minutes. Three minutes. Thank you very much. And I Thank want you. to first say I'm Elizabeth Davis, president of the Washington Teachers Union. And I want to thank those teachers that just left this table for their courage to come up and speak about the issues as they exist. Uh, and not as that as they, we would want them to. Uh, we would say that they are. And of course, I just left a five-day institute in, at Harvard with Chancellor Wilson and his management team of six people. 
And at the heart of that institute was a discussion about uh, issues, uh, the top three issues that the chancellor would like to collaborate with teachers and the WTU on. And teacher turnover was right at the top of the list. And of course, the first conversation I had with Chancellor Wilson is the one I've been having with you guys and council members and everyone else about the achievement gap in the district, which has grown since 2007 to over 40 scale points. It's absolutely outrageous. And he agrees that that is the second priority. The third is about some of those things that create teacher turnover, the achievement gap, uh, principal turnover, and that is social and emotional learning. Um, and of course, I had to include in that the social and emotional health of teachers as well as students. School climates that are toxic and lead to teacher turnover. And of course, I, I prepared a statement, but I wanted, as, as I listened to the three teachers who sat here before me, I reflected on my experience in three schools in Ward 8 and 7 and 5. I was, I was a highly effective teacher in all three. And my transfer from all three of those schools came as a result of my reporting unsafe, unsatisfactory, unhealthy conditions for students and teachers in those facilities. At one school, it was contaminated drinking water with lead. The second school had toxic fumes of tar that seeped into the building all day while kids were trying to learn because of a roof that was being repaired throughout the entire year. And the third was the removal of asbestos from Sousa Middle School for 18 months while the kids would remain in the facility. Of course, eventually after eight months of pleading with various individuals and stakeholders in Ward 7, the kids were moved to Shad um, Elementary School. But I have to think about what happens in schools where teachers are afraid to speak out about issues like that where they feel that they need to simply comply, where principals feel that they need to do something to reach the bar that's been set for them and increase graduation rates, irrespective of how many kids are pushed forward without being prepared. And all of those initiatives that are handed down to, to the local schools that force principals and teachers to game the system and how that ends up injuring so many of our kids who graduate and are not prepared. You heard a mention of some of that at Baloo. It's happening in other schools as well. We have data that we collect from our members around teacher turnover, LEAP, impact, why teachers are leaving. We do exit interviews with new teachers who are leaving after one year so that we will have our own data because a lot of the data, and even though we say that we are a data-driven system, some of the data that we use is basically feel-good data. What we would like to believe is happening, even if it does not really represent the successes of schools and kids and all of them. So I'll go to my point, my minutes that was written by our <laughs> communication person. I said, Liz, you must cover these points, and I must. Um, but at the end of this discussion, I certainly hope that uh, this board, when I appreciate you're having this hearing, would allow um, time to get extended comments from other teachers who have submitted them to us, but we have not prepared to have them ready today for you. Um, and of course, when we talk about teacher and principal turnover, um, I, I reflect on the responses given to the union by over 738 teachers who expressed their frustration and in some cases their anger um, as to uh, why they feel the need to leave the school system. We conducted a survey among members who are quitting the system this year, who quit last year and the year prior. And many of them echoed the answer of one high school teacher who wrote, I'm leaving DC public schools and moving to a district where the teachers voted on a new curriculum to adopt and created a two-year phased implementation plan. I'm excited to be working somewhere that values and respects teachers as true professionals. She concluded by saying, top-down initiatives lead to more bureaucracy and actually hurt student learning. There's been a lot written recently about the high turnover rate among DC teachers, but reports differ as to what the rate actually is. 
let's agree that whatever the exact number is, it's too high because teacher retention is key to producing first class education for the students in all DC public schools. One thing that has been widely reported is that teachers leaving our schools don't leave the profession. Like most teachers, they're dedicated and basically want to serve in schools that respect what they do. Teachers who leave DC and are quickly hired by other school systems is becoming the norm. Let's also recognize the fact that the highest levels of teacher turnover are in schools that can afford the least and of course, schools serving low-income students who in order to succeed need a wide range of services. Many services that some of our schools are not providing simply because we do not have it integrated into our curriculum. In our survey, our members leaving DCPS, one teacher wrote that to assure their longevity, teachers need three things from administrators. Support, support, support. Most teachers seek lack of support as one symptom of lack of respect. Another system is the fact that for five years, DCPS did not see fit to negotiate a new collective bargaining agreement with its, with its teachers. Teachers say they're frustrated with the system because they're not given the support they need to handle children who are suffering from the effects of poverty, from having parents who are forced to work two or more jobs or to keep food on the table. Classroom teachers must take on this burden but all too often, they are not given the resources they need to do the job. When schools are asked to reduce their suspension rates, students who commit level one through four infractions are allowed to remain in classrooms. And while I do believe that schools should find a way to serve those students without sending them home, the burden should not be put solely on teachers. So to provide the supports that schools need to provide in-school suspension counseling, is the way to go, not by reducing the social services or the providers of those services in each school. Most tragic, teachers do not receive the training and orientation they need to serve most DC students, especially children whose everyday needs are desperate and, and, and wide ranging. And while they do not receive the tools, they need to build first class educational opportunities. We've been demoralized into submission by implicit threats of low impact scores when you don't manufacture the desired results. That's the blue story, and that's the story that could play out in many schools. If teachers had the courage to report it, some teachers are leaving simply because they cannot and will not comply with those requests. And others feel the need to try to, to make it work. But in the end, the biggest losers are the students. One teacher wrote on our survey that impact brings out the worst in many colleagues and school teachers. Many are too focused on manipulating impact scores to be concerned about doing what's best for students. Another source of frustration among DC teachers and a reason for the high turnover is the fact that they feel drowned by paperwork, new initiatives, and are not given enough time to prepare effective lessons and activities for their students. In most successful school systems, teachers are allowed to spend the time it takes for instruction and preparation of lesson plans. Here they are allowed to allocate less than 10% of their time to preparation and are forced to use more than 25% of their day carrying out administrative tasks. So members of the board, I've Davis. listed just a few of the points. I haven't dealt with the solutions. We, we, we can. And I hear that I'm being called to close. Yes, ma'am. So I'm going to wrap up by saying, together, we can create a school system that assures each and every student receives the highest quality education possible, regardless of their race, ethnicity, zip code, and school climates that will facilitate teacher retention and not turnover. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Davis. Yes, I mean, uh, please remember you have three minutes. Mr. Martell, is there anybody else out here uh, besides Mr. Martell who has yet to testify? Mr. Martell, would you join us at the table, please? Okay. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Tanya Martin. I just want to say I was born and raised in Washington, D.C. I went to school in Ward 4 where I live, but I moved to Ward 8. And I see a very big difference. My, my daughter, she goes to Bloom. 
Um, she's a 10th grader. She'll be going to 11th grade. And my concern is, is that um, the principal, when you go up there, they really don't tell you exactly what's going on in the school. So you have to actually be a parent who goes up there. So when they see me, they know I'm coming up there for business. So everyone is kind of, here's Miss Martin. She's coming. What is she going to be saying? I ask a lot of questions. They never have any answers. The principal of um, Blue, I'm very disappointed in her. And I've called the chancellor to, to tell him, I've even emailed him, my, um, and I talked to Dr. Bay, which is her, her supervisor, in reference to how she acts at that school. No one can give me, no one wants to respond to my questions. Um, the behavior of the children, I've been there when they're acting like, I just don't know, I mean, almost like animals. They're cussing, they're cussing out the counselors right in front of parents. I mean, I, um, I've seen them when, I mean, when I come in, they just walking through the hall. No one, unsupervised, no one is actually telling these kids, go to class. I'm like, what's going on? I mean, these kids are just walking around, just like a, a free day, more so. Um, I've even saw a video where um, one student, she was tearing off, ripping all the um, documents off the bulletin board. And the um, super, su supervisor, I guess she was mad because she didn't have a teacher, for, I guess for, um, for a whole semester, a math teacher. And she just was going around and just ripping everything off and then they were, the kids were laughing. And the super, I mean the substitute, she just was sitting there looking. And I mean not even saying and just sitting there watching this child go crazy. Um, the, the chancellor, I have an issue with him too. When a parent contacts you, you should give them a response. Not have some just some general, I mean some general response like it's something that's already been typed up. If a parent comes to you with a concern about the school, I want I want to hear some results. I've been a bit blue when they had like 20 police officers, and I'm like, what's going on? And I called the school. They're like, oh, Miss Martin, that's what's going on. I said I just came left the parking lot. It's 20 police officers, but I'm so scared. I just go ahead and leave because I don't know what's going on. And this is not just, I mean, it's like three or four times. This is my daughter's first year blue. I mean, it's just unacceptable, the behavior of the school. It's like out of control. Um, I want my child to be educated, no matter if she's at Wilson, Roosevelt, Coolidge, Cadoza, at, at a school that's going to have some structure. I don't understand why. Really tell the truth, Blue needs a, a, a man, a male, a male figure. He, this woman, she's small like me. He, she needs someone that's going to go in there. We're not going to have this. She's, they're acting like, oh, and stuff. No, it's not like that. What you see, they show you this little picture, like everything's OK. But go there on a daily basis, on, on a weekly basis like me, and you'll see a difference. That school is out of control. And someone needs to get involved and do something before someone gets hurt. What is it going to take somebody's child to get killed, somebody's child to get stabbed, so, something to happen for someone to come in and get some structure in this school? My child, I told him this, my child's name is Skylar Aaliyah Thomas. And if my child does not have a teacher for a whole school year or semester, it's going to be some issues. And you know what? Because I come up there so much, they always like, all right, Miss Martin, we already know. We know you're going to come up here. We know you're going to give us what we ask for. So my daughter, they're going to make sure for 11th grade that she's in the classroom with teachers that are strong, teachers that are not going to live, I mean, or leave in school, and teachers are going to teach her because they know the type of mother I am. It's unfortunate that the teacher, the, the kids, they don't have a mother like me. They don't have a mother's up in there. They don't have a mother's calling. They don't have a mother. Everyone knows my name. They, matter of fact, they even know my cell number. If I call to be like, Miss Martin, um, how can I help you? Because they know when I come up there, I mean business. Thank you, Miss Martin. We hear you. Let's get it done. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, I'm Kashia Thorpe. I'm also a WTU building rep for my um, school. Um, and I also work with the Tomorrow Teachers Leaders Project. Um, so, first and foremost, um, I've taught in PG County before. That's actually where I started teaching. I didn't go to um, college, actually, to become a teacher. Um, I ended up falling into that um, profession. And my first year teaching in PG County, um, 
made me actually wanted to stay in teaching because I saw the dramatic impact I could actually have on students' lives. Um, after teaching PG County, I kind of moved away for a while and then came back into PG County. But when I came back, I really wanted to teach in the city because I really wanted to have that impact on students who were economically disadvantaged. I wanted to really have an impact on their lives. Um, and so I wanted to just get all the suburbs and really teach children that I could have that impact um, on their lives, um, and especially their education. So uh, I was discouraged a lot um, coming into DCPS, but I kept an open mind and I just kind of like pulled up my sleeves and said, I'm going in because I know it's gonna take work and I want to do the work. Um, uh, so even though the percentage of retaining teacher, um, effective and highly effective teachers has increased over the years um, in DCPS as they have reported it, um, there's still a great concern um, amongst teachers, parents, and even community stakeholders because of the vast impact it has on student achievement. Um, the reported 82% um, this year uh, reflects teacher retention within the DCPS system, but not teacher retention within individual schools, which is actually the real problem that is not being reported by DCPS. Rather, we have to depend on the media for that information. So why is DCPS not public um, publicly reporting this? In addition, I know several scenarios where teachers and other researchers have tried to actually get the teacher retention data from DCPS, and they have been totally uncooperative. One notable negative impact of individual school teacher retention is the achievement gap that exists between some schools, especially, for instance, um, schools like in Ward 1 and Ward 2, compared to schools, say, in Ward 7 and 8. Um, so take, for, for example, Ward 2 school, school, um, school Without Wall, which is in Ward 2. In school year 2015 to 2016, they, that, they actually have over a 90% teacher retention with a 95% graduation rate, and more than three quarters of their student population were proficient in both English and math. Conversely, uh, Ward 8 school, Baloo, Baloo High School had over, has had over the past five years a less than 50% um, teacher retention rate, which only probably increased um, last year, I think about 14% last, um, the last school year. Uh, consequently, the school barely graduated 50% of the student population, and only about half of the student population was proficient in English and math. With the highest district school turnover rate of teachers in Baloo in school year 2016-2017, who knows what their the achievement gap will actually be this time around. When effective and highly effective teachers leave these schools, they, st they start the school year with either in the middle of the school either in the middle of the school year or at the end of the school year to go to more favorable schools. It helps to widen the achievement gap. This is the price students pay. So no wonder why a recent action research that I actually conducted showed 100% of high school students, even those from Ward 8, did not choose any schools within Ward 7 or Ward 8 as an option because they know that this is tied to their student achievement and this is um, actually tied to teacher retention as well. So my ask is that the chancellor, the mayor, and DCPS only need, um, really needs to find ways to retain teachers within the system. Not only that, but they also need to definitely pay closer attention to specific schools and their administration and to determine the root cause of these turnover rates and address them accordingly. Um, just to finish up my time, um, I've actually, this year after the impact scores came out, I actually was very, very disappointed myself. And um, as the other teachers testified, as a WTU building rep, I know that I have been told not to be the building rep in my building because 
usually building reps get low scores. At the school that I'm at, I've never had but effective. I haven't gotten to highly effective, but last year my score was such that I was pushing to become highly effective this year. And this is the lowest score. So this year they have actually scored me developing, and I've never had developing. Consistently over the years, my score has increased. And I'm trying to figure out why I have a developing score when over the year it has shown that I've done numerous professional development to, to actually prepare me and develop, my, develop me personally and in the classroom as a teacher. My principal knows this because my principal also gives me permission to leave the building to develop myself and my craft. So at this point, I'm trying to figure out why is it that over the last four years, I've had so much development, but now I'm actually scored as developing. And over the year, as I'm developing, my scores have dramatically increased. So I'm, I'm just thinking that this bullying thing is actually real. I, as a building rep, even this summer, um, I have one teacher that has actually transferred, and she just actually emailed me and asked me, what should I do? Because I feel like I'm being bullied, because now that I told my principal that I'm leaving, they asked me now that, when I'm going to clear my classroom out, that security has to follow me around the building. Several days ago, when I was still an employee at that school, it was okay for me to come and go because she was working on projects there over the summer for the next school oh, year. Okay. But as soon as she's leaving, now she has to be escorted around by security. Thank you. Ms. Fuchs, Laura. Hi. Hello, uh, my name is Laura Fuchs. I'm a Ward 5 resident, DC Public Schools social studies teacher for the past 10 years, an executive board member of the Washington Teachers Union, chair of our Committee on Political Education, and I'm also on the board of the Ward 7 Education Council. Um, there are many elements that make a great school, from hardworking teachers that care about their students, a robust curri curriculum, a culture of academic excellence amongst everyone in the building to widespread opportunities for students. Our hope is that these factors will lead to creating engaged citizens who can participate in our world as adults on their own terms. All of these elements and goals are severely undermined by widespread teacher churn. My entire 10 years of teaching have been at H.D. Woodson High School in Ward 7. In my first few years of teaching, I was extremely hardworking, but I was still getting to know the community. In the classroom, I constantly asked, what, what? because I was still adjusting to the cadence, volume, and word choice of my students. I got along with the kids, and I developed deep bonds, but I still had major incidents that occurred in my classroom that at the time felt out of my control. Over the years, these incidents lessened and have now dropped to almost zero. In part, I've become a better teacher honing my craft. But there is something else at play. When students walk into my room, over half of them already know how to pronounce my last name, which is a little surprising. Um, since they've had friends, cousins, siblings, teammates, neighbors, and acquaintances who've taken my class. I have a reputation that I've built up with the kids, and I've also been able to adapt to better serve them. Beyond my day-to-day -day interactions with students, being at Woodson for 10 years has allowed me to develop programming that can provide great opportunities to my students. I've had the opportunity to teach AP US government for seven years now, and this has allowed me a chance to develop deep relationships and integrate outside programming, such as DC Youth in Government, which we do here, MICVA Challenge, DC Historical Society's Mock Oral Argument Program, Montpelier's We the People Constitution Competition, which we won this year, and more into my yearly coursework. This course has developed a reputation as one of the hardest courses in the school, and one that will be instrumental in preparing you for college. I used to have to beg students to take the course, and now students are actively stopping by to request the course and tell me they are ready for it. They know they can count on me to be there, and it gives them something to look forward to and prepare for in their senior year. So I know the importance of teacher stability in schools. I live it every day. But despite my deep commitment to the community-based teaching and providing stability for my students by simply showing up year after year, I often find myself considering if I can keep it up. This has not been easy, and there have been times I wanted to leave and find a school system where I'd be more respected and not have my job constantly threatened by DCPS central office and the evaluation system. I was even told by my principal once that I have Stockholm Syndrome because I was getting too upset over how my AP exam was being administered because I was freaking out about my impact scores. Um, and he thought I'd internalize a bit too much negativity being here. 
As the board, what you can do to help increase stability is focus on ESSA and the report card and include measurements that allow us to really focus on teacher retention and not just on test scores, including AP, so that we can actually have a force DCPS to have a good reason. They should do it anyways, but let's give them another reason to retain teachers. There's lots of different measures we could have. How long someone's been at the school. So what's the average years that teachers have been at the school? What's the average year they've been at teaching? Um, how many people left from one year to the next? Um, so there's lots of ways that we can measure these things, put it on the report card so that DCPS and the charter schools have a reason to try to make these numbers better because they're going to be seen and people are going to know about them and compare schools and act accordingly. Um, there's some other stuff with the report card with standardized testing we could also change so that maybe we can stop stressing us out on that level too because that also I think leads to people because English and math at Woodson have the highest turnover rates by far. It's no coincidence those are the two tested subjects and that those teachers get extra burdens placed on them that cause them to leave in higher numbers. So thank you. I'm going to have to excuse myself and I do apologize but I'm in the garage and they said I'll be locked in after seven. Thank you. Can I ask her one question that I was going to ask afterwards? Well, quickly, she, she don't get locked Wait, in the garage. So no, you would mention that there was discussion <laughs> about us putting out a report, and so are those? Are you saying those exit interviews would be available to us so that they possibly could be incorporated? The response is yes, absolutely. Thank you. And, and I will certainly get in touch with you. If there are any other questions, I'd be happy to take them while walking. <laughs> <laughs> they will lock. They will lock the yes, garage. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Mr. Merkel. Could you, Laura, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. My name is Eric Martell, retired DCPS teacher, a high school teacher. Uh, I wanted to address the uh, proposed, uh, the graduation task force. Uh, earlier today, I emailed you two requests regarding the graduation requirements task force. One, remove the three individuals from DCPS, the charter board, and OSSI who did not apply but are listed as applicants. Rather than task force members, they should be considered resources to provide background material. Number two, remove the individual re listed as a student of Sidwell Friends, a school that does not follow DCPS State Board of Education graduation requirements or subject standards. The graduation requirements task force can only make constructive recommendations if it has student data that actually describe the impediments to graduation, and that begins with first grade. The task force members need to also know what limits on recommendations the state superintendent has set. In other words, what are the de facto standards that they're going to be working on? Will she permit only one college and careers graduation pathway, or can there be more than one aligned to non-college vocational careers, including apprenticeships? If necessary, will the state superintendent apply for waivers from the Department of Education? And will the graduation task force be able to request from OSSI, DCPS, and the charters the data and explanations as to why the majority of students entering ninth grade are unable to do ninth grade work? Let's be clear that a student who shows up only some of the time is functionally illiterate and innumerate, has been socially promoted to make school officials look good, will not be accepted in college or in an apprenticeship program or be able to survive if enrolled in one of those to meet a, a college or even apprenticeship quota. In short, is this about addressing the real problems facing student achievement or is it to make DCP, DC education officials find another shortcut to make student data look better? I, I'll just add a few comments about IMPACT. IMPACT was designed by uh, think tanks that were privately funded by foundations that were not, that ultimately designed to disrupt the DC public schools. Um, one way in which to look at that is to think about a statistical problem. How can you statistically evaluate 
teachers on the basis of tests that are taken by students and then use an average based upon the random assignment of students to a school. That is a disruptive pr uh, process that has no validity in statistics. Tests are designed to be used by, to, to evaluate the person who takes the test, the student, in most, in, in, if we're talking about schools. But these tests are not used to evaluate the student to determine how to improve instruction or anything like that. They are, they are then used to evaluate those in the building, including people who don't even teach the students who take the tests. Now, this, you have to think w broadly about this because this is something that needs to be challenged, and it would be nice if the, and you, the way you start to challenge something is to ask the questions. Ask the questions and demand answers. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tansley, would you come to the podium, please? Our last. You will be our last participant in the panel. Hey, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is David Tanzi. I'm now a teacher at McKinley Tech High School. I spent the previous seven years at Dunbar Senior High School, both as a math teacher and for five of those years as the union rep, so I can speak to some of the cases beyond my classroom. So at Dunbar, I learned the reality and price of teacher turnover pretty quickly. By my third year, I was the second most senior math teacher, and three years later I realized I had, again, outlived all but one other math teacher. So uh, the kids recognized this. My very first year at Dunbar, I remember, uh, one kid exclaimed when I gave him some advice. He said, why should I care what you think? You won't be here next year. And he wasn't right about me, but he was right about a lot of other teachers. Uh, last year, not this past year, I don't know what the turnover is immediately, but the year I left, something like 70% of the staff left Dunbar. Seven zero? Seven zero. So there are a lot of causes of this. Um, some of it, and I'll speak especially to my early time at Dunbar, was we had a lot of young teachers, and they were not properly prepped for the task at hand and the stresses involved. That both means managing a classroom of kids with varied needs at some of our schools, like Baloo, the special ed population is past 40%. So handling that in, in a concentrate, concentration of a classroom can be difficult, but teaching kids generally who are you know, uh, behind grade level, et cetera, is, is a lot of work. Some of it is pressure from the state accountability system that as I heard Laura speak to earlier, the teachers who were in the tested subjects, namely English and math teachers who taught underclassmen, were under a lot of pressure to get those numbers up or else. And uh, because no one wanted those jobs, it was often the new uh, you know, first year, second year teacher who was placed there. So that compounded that. Um, some teachers left, and I'm obviously close with my colleagues, some people left just because they didn't feel like they were doing the right thing. Like that this, either they didn't have the capacity to, or the structures that were in place that limited them from doing what they thought was the right thing to do, um, made them feel like they weren't really serving the, the proper role as a teacher. I can think of two clear examples, people who were really excellent teachers who left because of that. And then finally, I heard the term bullying right as I walked in. There is some element of that. Like, it depends on what kind of leadership you have, but there are times when it's my way or the highway. And uh, I know one example uh, as building rep that was reported to me of a teacher who showed me that they had had a 3.5 something before they took a two week uh, break after a car accident. And then the next time they were evaluated, they were minimally effective. So that was obviously a shock to them, and it's not how you retain 
a teacher that had been rated highly effective who had committed a faux pas by your standard by taking off after an accident. And finally, I just want to say um, we often hear retention numbers uh, shared. Obviously, they primarily come from DCPS since it's the largest LEA. But they're misleading because I'm considered a retained, highly effective teacher, even though I left Dunbar. And Dunbar is the type of school that needs teachers who are highly effective and specifically highly effective in that kind of setting. And when we say we've retained them in the system where we're not really being honest, and the average isn't representative, because not all schools are like our matter of right neighborhood high schools. Those are the neediest places. I'd say our neighborhood secondary, I mean, sorry, uh, middle schools are next, and then some of our more challenged elementary schools. But the aggregate makes it seem like we keep most of our people, but it's an easy number to manipulate, because if you just don't give them highly effective the year, or effective the year before they leave, that hasn't, that hasn't affected your statistic. So that's, that is some of the stress, and I only heard part of the story, but of, of the idea of how was I an effective teacher or a highly effective teacher for years, and then somehow I, I became worse? Right. And that's, that's the disingenuousness that people go, I'm already putting 110% in, I, right. I, I can't do this and not feel like I have the support of my, my administration. Thank you. All right, three minute rounds. We're gonna start at the other end with Ms. <clears throat> Dr. Woodrow. If you have a question. I don't yeah. have a question, but I'd like to say thank you for coming out and sharing. It has, um, it's something that a lot of us know that is going on, but we need constant <coughs> reminders so that we, we can just not, know, Wood, but, could you speak louder, just not know things that are going on, but can make a difference in and start the motion moving towards change so that a lot of what was, was discussed today can end up with positive results because that's what we need. We need results that are going to impact our children, that are going to impact our community, our teachers, and our administrators in a positive way and school culture is at the top of that because if you're in an environment where you feel you're coming to school every day or to work every day and it's stressful, you can't teach, you can't learn, you can't administrate. Thank you. I want to thank you all. Um, first, I'll pledge to use my role on the ESSA task force to try to get some of this data. We've heard time and time again that the data is not there, the data is bad, and I certainly believe that. Um, so my pledge to you is that we will try to make the report card, um, make the other measures that we can work with um, as strong as they can. Um, but beyond that, I think just as a board and as policymakers, we need open and transparent data. Um, I want to thank Ms. Davis, even though she had to leave, for bringing up facilities. Um, as my colleagues know, I never miss an opportunity to talk about facilities. When a teacher is sweating to death, you can't teach. When you can't hear the teacher, you can't learn. Far too often, our facilities don't meet the basic requirements. And again, we don't have data around those. What are the acoustic levels in the classroom? What are the lumens? There are objective measures. We refuse to collect and publicize those. Um, the other thing I just want to touch upon around, it was talked about in a number of different ways, but culture within a school. And I think that comes from the leadership, from the teachers, and filters down to the students. And I'll commend Chancellor Wilson for his recent efforts and lots of conversation around implementing some new cultural programs in the schools. I would like to see some data behind those and some tangible goals. For the last several years, we've had annual chancellor initiatives. What were the impacts? What were the cost of those initiatives? Are they effective? And whatever we can do to learn from the teacher experience, what impact that those programs, those initiatives have on the classrooms, and most importantly, learning, we want to hear. 
Um, so I don't really have a question in there, but we did hear you on these things, and we will continue to foot, push and advocate for you. I just want to say thank you also for your time tonight. Thank you, Madam President. I have a couple of concerns. Um, the two teachers from Baloo are still here. Uh, the parent and the other young lady that spoke about some numbers in reference to Baloo. Uh, but it's, it's widely known. Uh, media reports spoke uh, this last spring about the great success that we're experiencing at Baloo. Uh, 100% college acceptance, 100% graduation rates, and I could go on and on, but, and I'm not prepared to discredit the principal and, and those reports yet, but you have raised a serious flag of concern. And I'd, I'd like you to speak to, to that in a moment, if, if you will, but I also want to speak to Ms. Uh, Davis's concern about the achievement gap. In 2011, I wrote a letter uh, to the city in reference to the achievement gap after the then mayor spoke so highly about, about the graduation rates and the improvement of our schools. And, and I looked at the numbers and I said, well, yeah, we're progressing, but our boys of color are still testing 25% beyond up uh, uh, lower than their white counterparts. Part and our girls of color were still also not as the achievement gap were not as broad, about 15% at the time. But if you look at those numbers today, we haven't moved the needle much at all. And I'm, I'm just gonna say this right here, right now, we've gotta get past happy talk in this city. If we're going to move the needle in education, we have brighter, better, gorgeous buildings, but it's not about the, the yep. buildings, it's not about the four walls, it's about what goes on inside those four walls. But I have a serious concern about Baloo, and, and I'm glad our council member at large, Mr. White, is here so he can hear it. Uh, but you, you brought up a flag of concern for me after hearing all those reports, because I was one of those people touting uh, the progress that was going on at the school. And now I'm hearing that it may just be smoke and mirrors. I hope not. But. Yes, it is, it is. Um, thanks, I actually wanna pick up with what um, my colleague Mark Jones has said about the happy talk, because it seems to me when we're in a system, and what I'm hearing is where there's no accountability, there's not, there's not a school board, there's not a newspaper that goes after it, um, and you combine that with the need for everybody to have high scores so that everybody looks good, mm -hmm. um, you have a lot of problems. And this board, we don't have um, governance or administrative authority over DCPS schools or over the charter schools. We do have um, the authority, and I was just, Unfortunately, my computer left me, but I was looking at our mission, and it includes um, providing leadership in advocacy. And I think that's really where we can fit in. Um, and uh, Mr. Whedon has talked about the transparency. I want to raise a few things, and then I want to put perhaps a question or a challenge to the councilman. I mean, I think there are a number of issues that have come up around transparency. Um, one, of course, we've heard all about the turnover numbers, and I was aware of some of those turnover numbers because I'd heard from Ms. Levy. I must say, I had never heard the 70% number, right? We're sh it's shocking enough that 33% is the average at the high poverty schools. 70% mm. is just shocking, and the idea that this is not well known, I, it's, it's staggering. Um, another issue of transparency, I've always heard lots of sort of complaints about how impact worked, but the idea that a lot of people are saying it's systematically used to bully people. Now, again, I, I don't know that that's true, but that deserves somebody looking at it. Mm -hmm. um, we can't be in a system where maybe that is true. Um, climate numbers, those are numbers that could be transparent, and as a couple of people mentioned, 
Um, possibly the climate indicators could go into the ESSA report card. Eventually, perhaps the turnover numbers could go into the report card. It's something that the state, the state board recommended to Aussie both of those things, and I know the task force will be pushing that as well. So all we have to do is commit, is convince Aussie and the mayor. Um, another issue that really hasn't come up so much today um, because we've been focused on this other issue that relates to transparency is the suspension issues. Again, it's, it's in the Washington Post. So here, people have said suspensions are going down, down, down. Well, it turns out the reporting of suspensions is going down, down, down. So I want to make a point here, which is if you ask for a certain goal and then you don't monitor at all how it's taking place and you don't support people in implementing it, you're going to get bad outcomes. And I think on the suspension issue, there's really two bad outcomes, and we've heard them both. One is you have people pretending, um, pretending that they're not suspending people, um, and they are. Mm -hmm. But the other thing you have is in a lot of schools, you have an effort to stop the suspensions, but not an effort to help the schools figure out how to teach the students who have the issues that are leading to the suspensions. And I want to very quickly raise uh, one example around that that we'll get to my broader point, which is the University of Chicago, uh, as some of you may know, runs a big research program. And part of what it does is it really goes to the school level to sort of see how initiatives are being implemented. And it did a, Chicago, like DC, had a proposal that um, suspensions were going to go down to X level. And so you know what? All the schools lowered their suspension level to that level. <laughs> But what they went in and found out is in about half of the schools, um, the achievement was up, morale was up, climate was up, achievement was up, kids were coming to school and they were learning. And in half of the schools, roughly, achievement was down and morale was down because they got the suspension number down, but they didn't get the climate right. So they found a shortcut to the number that didn't solve the problem. And it seems to me, in a high accountability, data-driven system like we have, we are really, really missing that monitoring, research, transparency piece that has to be associated with it. And I think it's a role somehow that the board can play. I think it's something the city council ought to be interested in. And I just wonder if there's a way that together we can figure out a way of taking some of these issues and actually commissioning serious reports on it whether we can stand up something like a University of Chicago Research Center that would look at these things systematically over time, whether there's a report that can come out on a regular basis that looks at these kinds of issues, maybe that's supplementary to what is going to go in the ESSA report because we need too many, we need so many other sign-offs on that. But some of this ought to be a public record and I think we can insist that it become public record, especially with the support of the council. And then we or the council or somebody, the auditor, can publish it. And I think um, thank you, Ms. that Wattenberg. is really a job. And I thank you all so much for coming out. And as others have said, especially the teachers who, uh, for whom this is uh, a bit of a risk. Thank you all. I have no further questions at this time, but I do appreciate your comments tonight. And if I do have any com uh, further questions, I will reach out to you directly. Uh, your information is all with our Board of Ed, correct? <coughs> Administration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, one, I want to thank everybody who came out tonight, including our panelists um, here at the table. I think to my colleague, Ms. Ms. Wattenberg's point, um, our authority, unfortunately, is very limited in terms of uh, direct oversight to some of these issues, but she made an even more important point uh, in that our mission um, includes advocacy um, and that in the big bureaucracy uh, that is education here in the district, the fact that we are your only independently elected representatives means we need to take extra seriously uh, our independent voice. Uh, and I, I thank my colleagues uh, for, for, in, for indulging that mission uh, today. Uh, your testimony will definitely make us better advocates. Um, obviously, we need more info, um, and we need to hear other sides of stories uh, to get the full picture and really make some meaningful recommendations. But I think that this was a very good start. Um, 
very quickly, um, and I'm going to try to do a really quick marathon here, Ms. Ms. Fuchs, you um, talked about some of the school level challenges and some of the district level challenges, but you also mentioned that, you, that you've been at your school quite a, quite a while. Um, and I think we've talked about a lot of issues, uh, and I know a lot of it has been you kind of rolling with the punches to a certain degree, but could you tell us very briefly, um, there had to have been some reasons you stayed. What worked that we could replicate system-wide that would help our teachers stay and be as dedicated to our students uh, as, as you've been for the past 10 years? Um, admittedly, I think it's kind of blind luck. I've had five principals, and my joke has been I'll be there till they fire me. And every <laughs> year it gets real close, and every year I have to question, am I going to get to be here next year? And it's the principals have always bailed me out at kind of the last minute and kept me. Um, I know it's not always worth their while. So I think a lot of it's going to look, and I mean, I believe in community-based teaching. So that's why I'm not going to let DCPS's initiatives push me away. But I'm also someone who's got kind of a warlike mentality, as anyone knows who likes me. Like, I like the fight. So I view this as a fight, and that by staying, I'm winning that fight. Like, they're trying to push me away, and I'm refusing to go. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> I mean, so unfortunately, like, you know, I don't consider myself a success story for DCPS. If anything, I got a lot of principals telling me that they, they ask them to get rid of me each year and my principals make a conscious choice not to do that to their credit and having five of them they always tell me when they're out the door like so I don't they have not done anything to try to retain me minus maybe get me lucky where I didn't get Dunbar's middle school principal I got Ron Brown's and if it'd been the other way I might be David Tansy sitting at another school like I don't know you know so that was luck getting Darren Slade instead of Zach E so I can't That's say true. what would have you know What's keeping me at Woodson? I think it's it's luck. And thank you. My final question is just a general one, and we'll do yes or no down the panel. Um, would these issues get more attention um, around teacher retention and, and disparaged teachers if these disparaged teachers were concentrated in more affluent school communities? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I just want to say one thing, and that is maybe you can request audits, audits of records, grade records, and so on. It's independent, Inspector General or whatever, um, such as the ones I was able to request. Thank you. And thank you all for your testimony. I want to, I want to address um, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, um, as far as um, Blue having 100% um, their seniors being accepted in college, they were going to a UDC community college. So when you live in the city, you usually get accepted in the city college. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, dismiss the panel now, but I'd like to say before you go that although the state board does not have authority over the hiring or firing of teachers at DC public or charter schools, we know that keeping good teachers in the classroom is vital to eliminating the achievement gaps our students face. I will ask the staff of the board to summarize all of your testimony that we heard today and attach each individual uh, testimony. Excuse me, I lost my place. And once the board has reviewed the summary, I will ask my colleagues to approve sending it to the Council Committee on Education for inclusion in the upcoming hearings. Thank you all for being here and please keep us appraised for inclusion in their upcoming hearings. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Every day counts truancy task force. It is vital for students to be in the classroom each and every day. The truancy task force strategy is threefold. The task force works to collect and report on key data points, measure, regularly analyze, and review these data monitor and craft information back policies in response and act. Tonight, we are joined by three panelists who will be providing an update on the task force's measure, monitor, and, art, and act framework. Aurora Stein, Steinle, Steinle, Senior Policy Advisor for Equity and Opportunity, Office of the Deputy Mayor of Education, Andrea Allen, Director of Student Attendance, DC Public Schools, and Hetty Chang, Executive Director for, of Attendance Works. The panel may be presented as a group. 
are they gone, the rest of them? So we missed them, but okay, I've got right. some slides. You have to <laughs> go ahead and present. Thank you. Okay, great. I'm Aurora Steinle. I'm with the Deputy Mayor for Education's office. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that my uh, remainder of my panel is left due to the time, but um, I am the only one of us, I think, that had a specific ask of you all, actually. So um, I'm glad that, that I could go ahead and present. Um, and several of the members of the board um, have had the opportunity to participate in our meetings. Um, our ongoing task force meetings occur on a bi-monthly basis. Um, we welcome all participation. We also have committees that um, dig in and do some of the, the work together as well. So um, today I wanted to focus in on what we're thinking about for this next school year. And so I'm gonna briefly talk about some of the work we've been doing, but I'm not gonna dig deep on uh, either some of the policy work, the data work, some of the things that we've spent time on so far. I want to talk about what's new, um, in part because I would like to seek the help of the board in implementing that. So um, I did start with a few background slides, um, and for some of you this will be very familiar, um, but just to make sure we're all on the same page of why we're talking about attendance. Um, student attendance is a significant challenge for uh, all of our students citywide. So um, we do see some, some bright spots, some schools that are really nailing it on student attendance, doing a great job. Um, but on the whole, um, our student attendance is something that's a challenge uh, starting in early grades, particularly kindergarten when there's a transition from non-compulsory to compulsory. Um, and then it improves a bit. We see another sort of uptick in the transition to sixth grade, higher in middle, and then um, quite high in high school. So there's a very significant jump. I think it triples, uh, nearly triples um, between eighth and ninth grade. Um, so this is a challenge that is really impacting a lot of our students and all of our wards. Um, and so again, there's some, some disparity across wards, but there's really not a ward that has admirable attendance rates. So the next thing to know uh, that again, you may be familiar with, but absenteeism is associated with a number of uh, negative consequences in terms of student outcomes and other city investments. So uh, missing school in early grades can predict uh, struggling throughout elementary school. Um, by sixth grade, if you're missing 10% of the school year, you're at risk of dropping out in high school. So it's one of those indicators that um, not only tells you something about the present moment, but can be very indicative of, of sort of what's to come. And so we really see this as something that uh, if we get a hold on early, we know there's going to be, um, if we improve it, some positive consequences down the road. And if we don't, um, some continued negative consequences. So the final just background piece I wanted to highlight is absenteeism also has a disproportionate impact on our at-risk and disadvantaged youth. Um, so for our economically disadvantaged youth, they're 2.3 times more likely to have been truant than wealthier peers. Um, our students of color are at higher risk of truancy, and same for absenteeism. I can talk about the difference. Um, there's also a disproportionate impact on our homeless students and overage students. Um, so this is a, an issue that um, has a disproportionate impact, which means we really want to focus on it as an issue of equity. The next slide, um, maybe I'll spend a little more time. This is, this is a really important slide. So when we look at the severity of absenteeism, what we're talking about is we know we have a lot of students who are meeting the threshold for chronically absent. That means they're missing, this is defined in the regs, defined, they are missing more than 10% of their school year. Um, so about half of our students are, uh, We'll focus on the positive, about 46% of our students have satisfactory attendance. 28% um, are at risk of becoming chronically absent. So they're in sort of a 5% up to 10% of their school year is being missed. Um, so we're worried about them, but they're not crossing the threshold. And about a quarter of our students are either in the moderate or severe uh, or profound category. And so what that tells us is that um, we should be worried about the 28% and also that we have about 10% of our students that have really severe absenteeism. So this probably isn't small stuff that needs to be addressed. This is like significant parts of their school year. Um, something is causing them to be uh, not in their classroom. And so we'll, we'll, circ we'll circle back to this because as we think about the level of severity, that's usually uh, important in how you think about what the solution might be. So again, I'm gonna be pretty brief on this, but to date, the Truancy Task Force, which we're renaming the Everyday Counts Task Force, um, which I'll just briefly mention why we're doing that. Uh, it's a shift from talking about just truancy, which is unexcused absences, to talking about chronic absenteeism as well, which is uh, for absences that may be excused. So you can imagine we're still worried about a student's attendance and the impact on their academic outcomes if they're missing school because of health reasons or other barriers that 
might be excusable but are still causing them to, to be at risk. So that's the truancy task force. Again, we meet bi-monthly. Um, folks on the board are very aware of this, but we uh, have agencies from education, the justice cluster, health, um, kind of bring everybody together. And we've been focused on reviewing data and improving some of the quality of the data. So for instance, it came to light that we didn't have a common definition of truancy. So we were doing a lot of accidental apples to oranges um, comparisons, and so we've, we've standardized that. Um, we've worked on improving some policies that govern attendance, so we had some legislation and amendment to the Attendance and Accountability Act that we worked on with council and with the task force. Um, started down the road of making some improvements in policy, a lot of room to go. Um, and we're also just coordinating agency activities and investments. So because we looked at um, that pie chart together with the task force of the severity, we lined up the different investments that we make as a city in those types of absenteeism, and we identified that we really could use more support in that um, very profound absence category. And so in the FY18 budget, there's an increase uh, in slots for uh, ACE and PASS, if folks are familiar, um, and also an expansion of the Stand Up Show Out program, uh, which is a little bit more in the um, at risk to just before profound moderate absenteeism, uh, where some like lighter case management and touches can be helpful. Um, so those are the types of things we've been working on. But the thing we've been thinking about is what can we do differently? Um, we had set a target of improving attendance, uh, re reducing absenteeism by 1% this last school year and 2% this upcoming school year. We we don't have final numbers yet, but we actually don't anticipate making that target. And so we want to do not only our anticipated goal, um, but go a little above and beyond this next school year to get us back on track. Um, and we think we've laid some groundwork, but we want to be strategic in our focus for this next school year. So I'm getting to some of Hetty's slides here. Um, if you want to check out her work on attendance works, she collaborates with school districts and cities and jurisdictions um, all across the country. She's a national expert. We're fortunate to have her here with us today. I um, had a number of conversations that will continue. Um, I'm just going to go to uh, take one of her slides and just focus in on it. This is um, the way attendance works thinks about tiers. So when I mentioned that there's different levels of severity of absenteeism, there's also different tiers of responses. And she's turned this over into a funnel-like shape where tier one is what you can do for everyone. These are things like uh, the school climate, positive relationships, common messaging, um, incentives that recognize good attendance. And the idea is that if you do enough of tier one, you have fewer kids, hopefully, that are reaching tier two. By tier two, you probably need some personalized outreach. Um, there's probably some planning that needs to happen and maybe an ongoing mentorship relationship. And then finally, by tier three, um, that's for the most severe absenteeism, um, you're possibly talking about coordinated uh, interagency responses. This could be a child welfare response, um, could be other partners needing to come to the table. So it's costlier and more individualized as you go down. And so just given the limited resources, you're really trying to maximize the impact of tier one and tier two before you get to tier three. So I'm going to skip a slide ahead to the um, slides that are specific to DC. Um, uh, Hetty was planning to present some information about Grand Rapids, Michigan, and you can find all this on Attendance Works. They're a really good model for us because, like us, they also had really high absenteeism rates, and they were able, through a citywide effort, did a lot of community engagement um, to see a change. So uh, back to DC. Um, where we focus in, seven, in school year 17-18 and where we're seeking your support, um, I think we're excited about some of the new investments in the Tier 3 work. Um, we're excited Stand Up Show Out will be doing some of the Tier 2 work. Um, but we really have a gap in how we're doing um, the, the Tier 1 work. This is the stuff that's supposed to be community-wide. Everyone's feeling it, seeing it. There's incentives out there that apply to everyone. There's a message that everyone's hearing. Um, there's, they're being engaged in a lot of different forums about attendance and, and a lot of people checking in with them. That's what we don't have. So when we talk to schools, they feel like they're kind of going it alone um, and that they're the only ones that are kind of trying to say attendance matters. Um, and so that's, that's a messaging question. Um, and then I think we talk to students and families. There's, we have some myths about attendance that we need to do a little myth busting about attendance adding up. It's very common for families either to not have the information they need about how many absences their student has or to not be clear on how those absences add up over time. Um, and then finally, there's not that many incentives out there where everyone's saying, oh yeah, if I, if I have great attendance this week, this month, this semester, this is what's going to happen for me or my family or my school. So 
Um, we're going to be continuing to do, uh, but really stepping up some of our work around these three components of the campaign, um, ed stats, which is really a version of the way we look at data together, and I think, again, various members have experienced that. Um, our, our push is going to be towards being more action-oriented. I think we've looked at some good data together. Um, it's not always clear how agency behavior changes as a result. And then finally, we'll continue to convene the task force and think about what are the other policy and legislative tools we might want to use. Um, our goals, we've kind of broadened, or we're planning to um, broaden some of our goals to not just focus on the end result, which we want to be reducing absenteeism, and we're still figuring out how we might focus that on specific target populations. We're seeking input um, from a number of different bodies, <clears throat> including the Cross-Sector Collaboration Task Force and the um, Everyday Counts Task Force. Um, but we also wanted to set a few goals that have to do with um, <clears throat> changing the community awareness, this is more of the communication side, and increasing the number of youth with an adult mentor. I will say this is hard to measure, but we have come back to that and heard that again and again um, from families and youth, from schools, and from now the national researchers, that having an adult um, who's checking on your attendance and who um, has a caring relationship that is encouraging you to go to school is a, is a difference maker. Um, so I don't want to dig too deep on the messaging, because I, I could talk through this, but I think you have it all in front of you. But in short, we're, we're trying to shift from a current a level of awareness, a type of attitude and a behavior, to a new state where we've raised awareness so it, people actually um, understand what the impact is of missing school, um, change their attitude from it's not a big deal to actually it is kind of a big deal, and changing their behavior to attendance being something they just don't spend time thinking about or monitoring um, to something that a lot of families are actively thinking about and monitoring. So uh, we're still, these aren't quite ready for prime time, but we've been thinking about these attendance messages. Um, the first one is uh, addressing the myth that we often heard that, that absences do add up. Um, so the myth being that they, they don't, it's just a couple days a month, it's no big deal. Um, the second one is that everyone can make a difference. As you can hear, this message is actually more oriented towards um, anyone who's youth facing, a community member, business leader, um, and then also our, our agency. Um, staff who are interacting with youth and families. And then the third message is that we care. And again, that's just going back to it. when there are adults that care, students are more likely to show up at school. Um, so we have a number of different audiences that we're seeking, and there'll be a little bit of nuance for each. Um, it's not enough to uh, communicate to parents only when we're talking about high schoolers who have severe absenteeism and are really making decisions for themselves. It's not enough to just have a student message when we know that family choices are often impacting attendance in earlier grades. Um, we have a great website, attendance.dc.gov. We're going to continue to have that be a hub for resources as we roll them out. Um, and so this last piece is, let's see, I think this is the part where I ask for your help. So as we focus on Tier 1 and Tier 2, um, it's going to be really important that we're, we'll develop messaging and materials and um, start to identify those incentives and supports we can offer, but not every school may need the same incentives, not every school may have the same champions. There may be business leaders that are important in one community because they're currently incentivizing students to come to their business instead of attending school. In another community, it may be a different issue and there may be a different set of stakeholders. Um, being the state board and being um, representatives of different areas in the city, uh, I would love to seek uh, the board's support in taking the, the generic stuff that we develop and then um, really uh, tailoring it to the different wards in the city and the different schools um, that you have concerns about. And I know um, as we work on uh, talking about attendance data and there's Tennis data becomes a conversation through the school report cards and other pieces. There's going to be a lot of ways to um, see how different schools in your awards are doing, and we want to be a part of helping and supporting those schools. And our focus, the task force, isn't as much on what exactly the LEA does, but how we as a city are helping them do what they do and how we're helping students and families. So certainly we're talking to them about their work, and I know there's interest in sort of taking a more LEA-based approach as well. Um, possibly through the work of the Cross-Sector Collaboration Task Force, so we're excited about that. But our focus right now and our ask is really what can the city do? Um, what are the other possible messengers out there um, who aren't just the school staff? Um, we want that, but there's a lot of other adults in the city who could be um, influencing students and families. So some examples of um, what our agencies are thinking, and again, this is kind of a heads up. Um, 
but uh, Parks and Recreation and our conversations about them, they talked about that they're a great resource for incentives. Um, so they have rock walls and they have pool parties and they have all these fun things. Why don't we connect those to our attendance initiatives so that we're using those rewards strategically. Um, the Public Libraries has an excellent um, listserv through their Books from Birth program and they're willing to push out our messages through some of their reach there. Um, and then of course we're still thinking about um, mentorship, we'd love to have, there's just can't be enough adults who are willing to mentor. Um, we're thinking about how to, how to work on that. Um, and we're not, we're not giving up or lessening our um, value that we place on the tier three interventions, those programmatic interventions. Um, but we're, we're, we are looking at the gap that we've had around tier one. So with that, I'll take questions or anyone wants to volunteer for how they're, how they're gonna take this on in their ward, that would be great. All right, members, you want to have a round of questions? Okay, we're going to start in the middle this time. Ms. Ms. Wattenberg. <laughs> okay, Ashley. I just have a couple quick questions. Uh, this is uh, a topic that I actually care a lot of a lot about, and um, you know, except for specific circumstances, if you're not in school, you're not learning. Um, I wanted to know, I know other states have programs uh, where there's a threshold a specific student must meet um, a percentage of attendance uh, that they must hit to either pass a grade or to graduate. Is there a threshold in DC? Uh, my understanding is that I think that's an LEA level policy at this point. Um, I don't believe there's an attendance threshold, um, but I can check that for graduation. I'd have to ask Aussie but I don't think that's the case. Okay. Um, the individual LEAs may be setting thresholds that I don't know about. Okay. Uh, and then also, um, homelessness specifically, that is an at-risk group that, and there are specific reasons that go into that, uh, why they are chronically absent. Are there any special programs for our at-risk group students, um, such as our homeless students and or rehabilitation programs for our chronically absent students that are currently being used right now? Do you mean specific to those populations or that might be impacting? So I'm thinking um, of both, like... Well, both our at-risk populations, such as our homeless students, mm -hmm. uh, because there are specific reasonings um, that obviously tie into why they are chronically absent. Um, but also for our other chronically absent students who may not be in part of that at-risk uh, category, are there any rehabilitation programs uh, that are currently being worked on right now? Um, yes, and some of the, so I can speak to some of the, the citywide programs, and then of mm -hmm. course, again, individuals, LEAs may be making investments that I, that I can't speak to. Um, but one of them is the Stand Up Show Out program, which is based on Check and Connect and is in you know, our public charter and DCPS schools. And we're excited they're gonna be expanding to high school this next year, which has been kind of a place they hadn't been. Um, and some of the same strategies around an adult checking and connecting and planning, um, we think can work in high school as well. Probably some tweaks needed too. Um, and of course, homeless students should be hopefully on the radar of their, the liaison in their school who's administering any McKinney Vento supports. Um, but we still do see things like transportation come up even when they shouldn't, shouldn't be a barrier. Um, and sometimes it seems like what we need to work on is just connecting all the dots around some of these students. And I think one thing we've, one thing we've seen as a best practice is that when you have um, some kind of an early warning system where you're looking at students maybe even before they hit five unexcused absence, at which point the district requires, the city requires um, a uh, student support team meeting to occur. Even before that, if you know a student is homeless or you know a student um, is at risk for other reasons or they just had poor attendance last year, um, there's probably reason to start the year with some kind of planning around that and it doesn't really matter which category put you there, um, but that could be found out by having a conversation at the beginning of the school year. Um, and that's something we'd like to see more of. And that's something that we're doing not just with the student, but obviously with the parents and all of those surrounding the student teachers, making sure that everyone surrounding the students aware. Obviously, yeah, we talked practice. about community engagement, parental engagements, number one. Yeah, that would be the best practice. Right now, what's the requirement that we that we know to exist is the required student support team meeting, um, which parents are a, I think, recommended if not required participant, um, along with other school staff. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, thanks a lot. Um, this is very interesting. My question actually relates to the past panels as well as with this one, which is we have as a goal lowering truancy way, way down mm -hmm. um, and raising attendance way, way up and so on. Um, how do you, and with the attendance um, and chronic absenteeism now being part of what would be the ESSA score for all the schools, presumably there will be more and more pressure on schools to have good numbers. Yeah. So per the discussion that was in the Washington Post today and the discussion that was here earlier, how do you guys, what is your role or how do you sort of um, make sure that what's going on in the schools is lowering the numbers in the ways that we see here for the purposes mm -hmm. that we have that are healthy? How do you, do you have a way of, I mean, do you go in and talk to other staff or parents and make sure the numbers are yeah, I mean, I see the data quality question as really one that we expect is Aussie's role, and I think they'll be engaged in that. They've had the opportunity to have the daily attendance feed, um, which is uh, which is daily, but then it's verified every month. I don't know. I think that's more of a quantitative sort of verification, not like a right. they're not going right. out and visit schools. Um, but uh, I would be uh, interested to hear, and we'll have the conversation with Aussie about what it means to continue to do data quality. Um, on an element of data that we know there'll be an increased spotlight around. Well, I would highly recommend that because that's exactly in the Post article today. It did talk about schools turning over, um, it was essentially attendance data, that people were, uh, I mean, it was the reverse, that people, what was it, that they were in school when they were really out um, is what was being reported. And I've, and I've heard that a number of, um, uh, in a number of different conversations. So I think figuring, figuring that out and making sure that it, there is a real qualitative check I just think is huge. So I leave it at that and Agreed. wish you, um, that you and Aussie figured that out in a pretty serious way. Makes sense. Mr. Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Um, <laughs> homeless children. Have you been to any of the homeless shelters yourself? I have not. Okay. Uh, I want to commend the mayor for offering free transportation for the children. That helps. However, even the worst parent will not put a small child on a bus where they have to transfer two or three times to get to school. And that's one of the dilemmas in the homeless shelters. Mm -hmm. We talk about D.C. General. But what we don't talk about on New York Avenue, every motel has 80 to 100% occupancy of homeless children. That doesn't include the hotels. And during hypothermia season, even the exclusive hotels take them in. So you have these families from all over the city, not to mention Maryland and Virginia, Transportation is, is one of the key things to help those families get their children to school. One of the answers is maybe they need to subsidize the transportation for those parents to get those children to school. I'm here to help you. I'll offer help. I have other men and women in my ward who will help. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of knowing the people in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, Spingarn, which is closed now, had a big truancy issue. One of their, and absenteeism issues, one of it, their problems was the Langston Golf Course. They have a cafeteria there. And the children love the food there. So they would just go and hang out all day long until the principal Mr. Washington said, Mr. Jones, what can we do about it? I just simply went over there and I talked to the people, because I play golf there, and, and I know a lot of the people there. Uh, and I asked them, I said, don't serve these children. Mm -hmm. Do not serve them. And then I asked some of the older, older gentlemen that go and play cards, I said, help me police it. And they did it, and it changed. But the DME and the administrators, you've got to get to know the people in the communities that can do those things. Uh, 
quite frankly, you're not going to be able to do it. In some community, you might be able to. But in other communities, you won't. There are communities I can't do it. But you have to ID those stakeholders in those respective communities that can do those things. Um, but transportation is a big issue for the homeless families. Mm -hmm. Find a way or consider a, a way to talk to the, our legislative body or the executive about transportation because that's one of the biggest issues I see every day on New York Avenue. Those children are going to school late or not at all and if a family doesn't have the money to take that small child to school and most of those children in those homeless shelters are small children. There are elementary school children. They have some high school children but most of them are elementary and middle school children. They need transportation. That will help tremendously. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I appreciate that. And I, and I would add to the transportation issue, um, even for those that are old enough to be riding the bus, there's safe passage issues that go beyond that, too. So transportation is a hot topic, and attendance is definitely on our radar. Great, thanks for uh, your time and for staying as late as you have. Um, I'm curious about whether you've disaggregated the rate of truancy between charters and DCPS, and if so, what is the difference, if any? We, we have. Um, right now, we report out on quarterly uh, on truancy by sector, and that was a part of the reporting that caused us to identify that the methodology hadn't been the same. Um, I don't want to misstate the numbers, so what I can do is send you, this, this information is actually all public too, we post the quarterly reports on attendance.dc.gov, I think it's the data tab. Um, if not, it's under truancy task force documents. Um, what we're hopeful is that we could actually start looking at quarterly data um, around chronic absenteeism. Right now we look at truancy and ISA, but at least that allows us to look at the two sectors. Um, my uh, general summary would be that there wasn't too much good news um, in either sector, um, but that, and there was also some different patterns by grade band was something else to kind of look at when you see that, um, which hopefully means that if one sector can teach us something about what we do in one grade and another can teach us something about what to do in a different grade, um, it'd be ripe for some cross-pollination of ideas. Um, and I guess I would ask the same thing related to specific schools. Have you, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've looked at whether there are schools who are breaking a prediction associated with attendance and what we are doing to capture what's happening at the schools that are beating the odds? Yes, um, we had a few of those schools come and speak to the task force. I think it's been a bit, I think it was maybe last fall. Um, and then we've spotlighted a few um, schools based on, the, based on the data to see what they've been doing. What we've seen is usually it means they have an explicit focus on attendance. It's not happening. Um, by way of some other thing, um, although school climate generally improving is your attendance will probably improve, those things are definitely related, but usually the principal is actively thinking about attendance. Um, and in the same way that the task force looked at data and said, hmm, we know based on every other school year before that there's gonna be a huge uptick in absenteeism you know, before a long weekend or after a long weekend or on Fridays. Um, we know these things, so let's have you know, celebrations on these days. Let's schedule, someone gave the example, schedule school pictures on those days. Like take the things, the tools you have and use them strategically and schools that are seeing results are being really thoughtful about how they do that. Thanks. And I also wonder what you have um, learned about the role of students actually feeling engaged, especially in high school. And this relates directly to the work that the high school requirements task force will be taking on and thinking about whether some of the requirements themselves are presenting a disincentive to students to stay in school because they aren't things they're most interested in. Uh, they might be interested in a different set of subject areas that aren't, you can't graduate if you don't pursue a very specific and um, somewhat regimented set of credits in Washington, D.C. So I'm wondering what you've learned about student satisfaction and its role in, um, in attendance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there definitely is a role. Um, when you said uh, satisfaction, I think maybe you said the word engagement, which is something we think about a lot, because what I have heard a lot of is that um, students sometimes, this is like painful to hear, it's painful for them to say it, but it is not said infrequently. Students don't feel like 
there's an adult at their school who wants them there. And so, and they don't feel like school has something to offer them, whether that's an adult who wants them there or content that engages them. It's not um, just the students, it's the parents also. And we, I've had conversations mostly with students. Um, and so, but uh, when we hear that, it definitely makes us think a lot about what, how the school environment can draw students in and give them a reason to be there. Uh, just one thing I'll note is we had a student design challenge last year, um, and we're actually having the next one uh, next week on the 25th. Um, task force members have been invited, and I think a couple folks are planning to join us. Um, these are, last year we had done citywide teams, so it's kind of a mix. You came from all over the city. We paired you with different citywide officials. This year, because we didn't really have an implementation path for the great ideas that came out, which was really disappointing to us and caused us to revise our thinking. This year it's school-based teams, so the implementation path is they'll be working with their schools to implement the ideas they come up with. So now we have a clearer path for student voice in solving this problem. Um, and so it'll be teams from uh, Blue, Anacostia, Washington Met, Cardozo, <clears throat> Wilson, and Paul Public Charter School. And they'll be joined by their SROs, and then we're excited to have the task force join us to provide some kind of um, just insights and feedback once they get to the point of the, the day where they're. You mean they're designing right. solutions to absentee? Uh, absence yeah, sorry, it's problems. focused specifically uh -huh. on absenteeism. I, I just, because I looked through your packet, and I, I feel like I don't know if we're really getting at the root cause, right? I understand there's awareness challenges and there's some low hanging fruit that's moved the needle a tiny bit. But I mean, even the goal of three to five percent, there's data out in, in LA about how just media campaigns that are very targeted through mass mailings have improved attendance at least in college classes that I'm sure is relevant and you all have looked at. But that is like, it, after hearing what all the teachers just said about environment and that being a challenge and knowing that kids are dropping out because they're just not engaged, they're not interested. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a number, I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but it feels like we're dancing around the edges of a massive issue related to whether our schools are preparing students in a way that's engaging for 21st century. And I, I guess that would be my parting thought, like incentives to get a pass to something or another might work once for one student on occasion, but if they're chronically absent, there's something fundamentally happening there. And all the money that's going into this, I wish it would be going toward things that are like deep, deep, deeply root causes of the reasons we have truancy. And I'm sure that's there too, and I don't, I don't know enough about your work, but that would be like my takeaway out of reading the presentation. Yeah, if I could respond to that. Um, so yes, and one thing I fear with this presentation, and I'm becoming increasingly conscious of this as we start to put it out there, um, is it's not, the campaign is not the thing in itself, and it's not, it doesn't exist alone, and the assumption is that we're doing the work around poverty and around school quality that needs to happen um, that's a lot deeper and a lot more challenging and that we have a lot of investments already in. Um, but that doesn't mean that we leave schools out to dry when they are saying, please attend, attendance matters, and no one else in their community is talking about it, and we have maybe some incentives that actually cut the other way coming from the air, what's surrounding the schools. And so I, I definitely, this is not simple, and this is not about messaging alone. So thank you for that comment. Um, I completely agree with my colleague. I would love to be brief on the deeper efforts that you're doing. Um, you know, hearing about the efforts to give away Chipotle gift cards, that'll get kids there for five minutes. Mm -hmm. That's not gonna change behavior. Um, where I'd, and I don't really have a question here, it's more just a comment again. Um, when we talk about the difference between truancy and chronic absenteeism, I'm pretty sure my daughter was in that latter category last year. Um, but the way it gets reported back to me as a parent, I get a report card or the quarterly report card and it says my daughter missed class, you know, six times this quarter, 12 times this quarter. So, but yet she's doing fine and her overall absence or unexcused absence was zero. So we're sending mixed messages with the documents, with the report cards that we get. Now, why was she absent so many times? I kind of feel I should put this out because of sports. <laughs> you know, she's on the cross country team. She's doing a club, Model UN, whatever it is. But within the school and within the tracking system, she's reported as not being in class. So I think we need to really focus on in-seat attendance and explain that, you know, 
or, or be able to convey to parents that it's not okay that we're missing class, but we are sending mixed signals here when we're pulling students out for a day-long cross-country meet, when they're missing class for a field trip and other things, what's okay and what's not. Um, I'd also say I think there's some data problems. Like I said, my daughter, I think, had zero one absences last year. That's not accurate. Um, there were a couple extra days that she missed because she was either sick or for a visit to grandparents that somehow got excused that really shouldn't have been. So there is a data problem, coming back to my theme of the night. The data is not accurate. We need to do a better job of getting data. Um, and I would love to see data on truancy, on chronic absenteeism, and really looking at what some of those chronic absenteeism or chronic absences, what are the causes of those? Are they legitimate educational things or are they not? Thank you, Mr. Wheaton. Dr. Woodard? Yes, um, I'd like to thank you um, for presenting this. I do feel that we need to dive deeper into the reason why truancy happens or absenteeism is there or is it being reported or maybe that there needs, a, there needs to be a different breakdown of why children may be absent because like my colleague, I was just sharing with him that I know of a, a person where their, uh, the family where their child has been absent at least 25 times, but it shows zero absence. And basically because of a sport and that the school acknowledges that they're that good, that they're Olympic material. So they're allowing this to happen. So it, they're, having categories is important so you have a better idea of why it happens. Is it because it's homelessness? Is it because this individual child may be doing something that is exceptional and we need to have a different category for that? particular kid because homeschooling within schools are important too and if we have children that are homeless that can't get there because of transportation well is someone is a, is a teacher assigned to go in to make sure that that child is getting what they need we can get at that if we have categories within a way to look at truancy and absenteeism within our schools for reasons why so d diving deeper would help us get to that. But thank you for the information that you have shared. Thank you. Mr. Bachelor. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you uh, for your patience and for your presentation. Uh, obviously, this issue um, is very important to me uh, as the students in my ward bear the, the largest brunt. Um, I think I'll echo a little bit of, of what my colleague said earlier is that um, I think the root cause of the issue, and I think somewhere where we can think deeper um, about this campaign, is that uh, f for a vast majority of those who are, who are chronically absent, um, uh, the, there's not necessarily an ignorance to the consequences of being absent. The unfortunate part is that the absence is a consequence to something else, right, something deeper. Um, and I think that, that can, this campaign, uh, I think, can be an integral part of really pushing our schools towards addressing uh, some of those issues. And, and I noticed um, uh, school climate is one of those things, right, making, making sure the students want to come to school, that they believe that it's an inviting and productive place uh, for them to be. Um, and as much as I think we want to encourage our, our LEAs and our individual schools to look inward, I think it's also, it should be an also uh, an important piece of this campaign to encourage our schools to look outward. Uh, you mentioned earlier, right, the show up standout grants that in, in a lot of schools in my ward are doing phenomenal things, right? You know, there's a concerted effort to partner with nonprofits um, to, to engage families, right? And we're seeing the dividends to, you know, to show for it, right? You know, ab you know, absenteeism is down, student satisfaction is up, and so we need to encourage schools to also look outward and build those partnerships um, that that will make a world of difference and accomplish some of the things that, quite honestly, and both you and I know this, that government can't do, right? We can't do everything, um, but but I think our biggest leverage is the community around us, uh, and so my hope is that that's also an imp uh, important part uh, of this of this campaign. 
campaign. My colleague, Mr. Jacobson, uh, is really excited about this campaign. Um, and as, as chair of the uh, Outreach and Public Engagement Committee, um, it's something I pledge to him that we would take up and figure out both uh, how us as individual members, but collectively as a board, promote this campaign. And like you said, indiv individualize this messaging to the communities we represent. So we really look forward to working with you uh, and, and making sure that, uh, that this plan really touches uh, the needs of all of our students in all eight wards. So thank you very much for being here. Madam President, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam President, and thank you so much for being here today. Um, I want to uh, commend Mayor Bowser and her team for their laser focus on attendance from including attendance metrics in the, um, in the ESSA uh, requirements, I think is really important and really creative the way that Superintendent <coughs> Kang went about that by not just focusing on straight attendance numbers, but on improving existing conditions and, and getting credit for growth within the attendance metric. I think that's really terrific and I appreciate, and I hope you will bring that back to your boss and her boss as well. <laughs> um, the Truancy Task Force, and I wanna go to, back to my colleague Ms. Wattenberg's question on data, and, and some of the other colleagues have hit on that as well. The Truancy Task Force has a data committee. Is that data committee developing business rules on how schools need to report attendance numbers? So historically, that committee has been led by the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, which is sort of a product of how, how the original Truancy Task Force came to be and um, their leadership around specifically <coughs> truancy, which again was focused on um, unexcused absences. Um, as we now begin to incorporate attendance into our citywide thinking and we're moving our thinking towards in seat attendance and towards chronic absenteeism um, and incorporating it in things like our school accountability framework, um, I think I anticipate that role might be better positioned for OSSI. I will say we had had the conversation within the data committee around the truancy um, definition. That was something we worked out the business rules there, but then it was um, OSSI that sort of made those into you know, official, they were, they would have been um, only implemented from the CJCC, which isn't really doing the analysis. The LEAs were passing on that data and the CJCC is just kind of collating it. Um, and so as we are now using metrics um, and the same things that we would like to check in on quarterly as a task force are something that's being used citywide, which is exciting. I kind of think it'll make sense at some point to pass the baton, especially since we're not just talking about truancy, we're talking about in seat attendance writ large, which really falls into the education camp, not the CJCC camp. So that's something I could imagine evolving over time, but um, we've been kind of waiting, watching, giving space for the um, ESSA process to um, roll out. So we haven't uh, had that conversation yet with CJCC. Hey, I'd, I'd encourage you to get ahead of the curve on this, and I know that you've got a lot of balls in the air and you're working on this from a lot of different angles, but getting those business rules in place and getting them right is going to be really mm -hmm. important to have um, to have hard data so that we aren't penalizing the wrong schools or rewarding the wrong schools on right. the attendance metric under ESSA. Um, I just have a couple seconds left, but um, what will a three-point improvement in attendance from a 90% general attendance rate to a 93% attendance rate, what does that actually mean to our students? So one thing is just we're actually trying to reduce absenteeism by three percentage points. So um, okay. our ISA is 90% on average, but our chronic absenteeism rate is more like, uh, I think it's about a, a quarter of students. Um, and you just want to bring that down by three points to a fifth of students? To... Give or yeah, take. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, that's correct. And truancy is currently a little lower than that. So. Uh, but what, do you mean how does that look for students in schools? Like, like what, what's, the vision? what's the, what's that mean at the end of the day? Like, like why was that goal picked and what do we think that that number will do? Yeah, I think we were trying to be modest in our initial, we're, we know we're still on kind of an on-ramp here and some of the work that we're doing in coordination collaboration doesn't impact students yet. So we can change the definition of truancy that's helpful in how we have a, a meaningful conversation about it, but that actually is not a change that impacts students' day-to-day -day experience at their school. And so we know there's kind of an on-ramp here, and we looked at the improvements that were made by other jurisdictions. 
um, the example that I know Hetty was going to share about with Grand Rapids, Michigan, they actually didn't see improvement in their first year of their initiative, but then they saw this crazy jump, and I don't I don't want to make our figure look small, but I think it was over the course of two years they saw a 9% reduction. Um, their numbers were actually even higher than ours, which is hard to do because ours are quite high. Um, so we kind of looked across at what other improvements have looked like, and um, we were hoping to set something that we could be successful with. At this point, 3% we actually think is ambitious given how we've seen atten attendance numbers look more like this lately. Um, seeing it go like this would be um, exciting. Since I only asked a quick question last time, I've been allowed to ask one more quick question or make one quick comment. Um, as you have said and as everybody has talked about, making a dent on the truancy and the chronic absenteeism is a combination of a lot of big things and, and small things. And I just want to throw one out that may be relevant. It's my understanding, and maybe some heads back there can nod if I'm right, that under the new DCPS grading system, um, absence really is no longer a leverage point for a grade. I, I'm getting nods. So I, okay. that is a cross message, right? That it used to be, you know, as when we grew up, coming to school actually mattered, coming to your class actually mattered. And now teachers are, as I understand it, prevented really from using that. And the way the grading works, uh, it doesn't count. Um, and that might be something to look at. And again, the main reason you want kids to come is because they have something to come to. So I don't want to suggest that that's an answer either, but these things work together. And as you pointed out, the messages need to connect. So it's something to keep in mind. Thank you, board members. Anything else? Uh, Aurora, thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate all your Cheers hard support. work on this issue. And I got a lot. Um, yes. No, I was just saying thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we had a present, well, I was present at the presentation they did earlier today on, and we had more in depth, and I'm sorry that we went so long that we could not get the uh, input from the other people, uh, but maybe at a later date we can come back and try that part again, if possible. Yeah, I think the good news is this is an ongoing conversation for our city, so I know Hetty's going to be continuing to be uh, engaged with us. That would be great, because that was a good part of the presentation, to see what they, would, they did in the other cities. Okay, um, so with no further business before the board, I would like to entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The meeting is adjourned. Thank, thank you.